Hour being 7 p.m. on Monday, April 26th, 2021. I'd like to call to order the Laconia City Council meeting. Prior to anything though, I'd like to read the introduction for electronic meetings. As mayor of Laconia City Council, due to the COVID-19 coronavirus crisis and in accordance with Governor Sununu's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this board is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen to the meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, this is to confirm that we are, A, providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possibilities by video or other electronic means. We are utilizing the Zoom platform for this electronic meeting. All members have the ability to communicate during this meeting through the Zoom platform, and the public has access to watch the live YouTube video at www.youtube.com forward slash Laconia NH. Listen to this meeting through dialing the following phone number, 1-301-715-8592, or participate by the Zoom app, webinar ID 863-5827-1359, password 536-464. B, providing public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting. We previously gave notice to the public of, of how to access the meeting using Zoom and instructions are provided on the City of Laconia's website at www.laconianh.gov. C, providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anybody has a problem, please call. 527-1265, extension 243, or email at cityclerk at laconianh.gov. And D, adjourning the meeting if the public is unable to access the meeting. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, we will adjourn the meeting and have it rescheduled at that time. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Let's begin the meeting by taking roll call attendance. When each member states his presence, also, please state whether there is anyone in the room with you during the meeting, which is required under the state right to know law. I'd ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councilor Cheney. Council Chambers with two other councilors. Councilor Susie. Home and alone. Councilor Lippman. Home and alone. Councilor Haynes. Council Chambers with two other councillors. Councillor Hamill. Council Chambers with two councillors. Councillor Felch. At home alone. Mayor Hosmer. I am in Laconia City Hall in the mayor's office and I am alone. Prior to going any farther, I'd ask uh, Councillor Cheney, if you'd be so kind as to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. Thank you, Councilor Cheney. Let me drop my pen. Okay. We are joined this evening by uh, the aforementioned city clerk, Cheryl Hebert, uh, by city manager, Scott Myers, and by uh, city finance director and IT specialist, Glenn Smith. Under item number seven, which is the acceptance of minutes from previous meetings, uh, the meetings, the minutes from the regular meeting of April 12th, 2021 were distributed to the city council on Wednesday, April 14th, 2021 with no corrections or changes submitted to the clerk. The minutes will be accepted as distributed. Moving along to item number eight, under consent and action items. 
This is a request to approve a temporary traffic order 2021-03 for the Winnie Fishing Derby and to waive all fees associated with the event. The event. Um, April 7th, 2021, the Special Events Review Committee approved the Winnie Fishing Derby application for this year's event. The temporary traffic order is attached. This is a recurring event. A request has also been submitted to waive all city fees associated with the event. The Daniel Webster Council of the Boy Scouts of America is a 501c3 nonprofit and proceeds from the Fishing Derby support scouting in New Hampshire. Um, Motion we'll be looking for right now is a move to approve the temporary traffic order 2021-03 for the Winnie Fishing Derby as presented and to waive city fees associated with the event. So made by Councillor Felch, seconded by Councillor Haynes. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Councillor Cheney? Yes. Councillor Susie? Yes. Councillor Littman? Yes. Councillor Haynes? Yes. Councillor Hamill? Yes. Councillor Felt? Yes. Six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. Moving along to 8B, which is um, the topic is Wake the Lake 2021, block party on Lakeside Avenue. Um, <clears throat> a temporary traffic order 2021-04. A request has been received to hold Wake the Lake 2021 on Lakeside Avenue on May 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, 2021. The event will be held from the hours of 5 p.m. on Friday, May 21st, 2021, to Sunday, May 23rd, 2021, to 5 p.m. The special event application and map of the event are attached. The Special Events Review Committee approved the event at their meeting on April 7th, 2021, and a copy of their notice of approval is attached. In addition, the organizer is requesting to extend hours of operation of sound equipment and or loudspeakers for Wake the Lake 2021. Section 161-4 of the city's code states as follows, notwithstanding the provisions of this section, no licensed outdoor sound equipment and or loudspeakers shall be permitted to operate past the hour of 9 p.m. Sunday to Thursday and 10 p.m. on Friday and Saturday with the exception of motorcycle week, when such equipment shall not be permitted to operate past the hour of 12.30 a.m., Sunday to Sunday. This provision shall not apply to the operation of any radio broadcasting station operating by virtue of a license of the Federal Communications Commission or loudspeakers or sound equipment operated exclusively within any building or other permanent structure. The organizer of the event is requesting that the time set forth in the ordinance above be extended for till 11 p.m. So the city will be reimbursed, will be reimbursed for all associated costs with this. This was submitted, the report was submitted by Scott Myers, the city manager and staff recommends that the organizers request be approved as presented. Be looking right now for a motion to approve temporary traffic order 2021-04, Wake the Lake 2021, to allow alcohol consumption on city property in the designated areas only, and to extend the hours of operation of sound equipment and or loudspeakers from 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. for the duration of this year's event. So made by Councilor Cheney, seconded by Councilor Felch. Be looking for any further discussion at this point on this motion. Seeing none, I'd ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councillor Cheney? Yes. Councillor Susie? Yes. Councillor Littman? Yes. Councillor Haynes? Yes. Councillor Hamill? Yes. Councillor Felch? Yes. That's six votes in the affirmative and that motion passes. That brings us to number nine on our agenda, which is, uh, this is the opportunity for citizens to make comments for matters not on the agenda. If there are citizens listening in who would like to address issues with the, uh, that regard the city, and those issues are not on tonight's agenda, now would be the appropriate time. And Mr. Smith, I'll wait on your cue. 
Mr. Mayor, Charlie St. Clair has raised his hand. <clears throat> Welcome, Mr. St. Clair. Good evening, good evening, everybody. Thank you. Uh, and if I've got this wrong, uh, please correct me. Uh, if I, if you want me to wait till later on matters on the agenda, I, I'm not talking about the traffic plan for Motorcycle Week. I want to discuss what we've discussed at the last meeting with regards to uh, the vendor situation and uh, the outside entertainment test. So would you like me to discuss that now or uh, bring it up later? Is it an item on tonight's agenda? Not specifically, no. Then you can, uh, you may feel, be, feel free to address it now then. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I wanna just revisit again, um, the city's current limitations on the outside of, vendor, uh, of the vendor tents. And uh, right as it stands right now, uh, the city is requiring a 15 foot space between tents. And uh, for the life of me, I, I really, I guess I just don't understand what will be accomplished by that uh, other than you must have gotten an email. Hopefully everybody got an email that I had sent out uh, from the board uh, this past Friday. But again, <coughs> just for the public and yourselves, uh, by doing that, you're potentially limiting the number of vendors that we'll be able to set up in the city. And we expect a, a pretty good uh, crowd this year. So what will in fact happen is that the crowd will end up being or the crowd, the customers will end up being um, restricted to only a limited amount of tents, uh, which will then increase, potentially increase the number of people at each tent versus letting them spread out everywhere. And the same thing would be, well, let me get keep on that. On the boardwalk, by creating a 15 foot space there, we are creating the potential of people congregating between the tents uh, to look at the view or whatever. Uh, and that again is not conducive to keeping people spreading out, um, doing what we want them to do. So I would encourage that the council revisit that and perhaps just uh, having the vendors set up just like we've had it in the past. I, I'm sure I don't need to remind the council also by having that 15 foot gap on the boardwalk, we will be cutting into the potential income uh, for the city, for the Motorcycle Week uh, line item budget. And, and that is never a good idea, I don't think. The other item I wanted to talk about. So, also, so Mr. Mr. St. Clair, are you suggesting that vendor booths should be farther apart? <laughs> Not at all. Um, I'm suggesting that we, we have it as we uh, have in the past. Okay. All right. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Sure. So the other item that I wanted to talk about is the outside entertainment tents for areas that normally do not have yearly um, outside permits for, for such activities. And we're really talking, I think, about three to four locations uh, it, within the city limits. And again, we, we've all heard, I, I think everybody has heard, uh, even from Dr. Fauci this weekend, uh, that outside activities are the best uh, for the airflow, for, you know, it's just, it lessens the impact of, a, of this virus. And by not having the outside entertainment tents, we are actually encouraging people, or not encouraging perhaps is not the right word, but we're pushing people to go inside of, of establishments. And unless something changes by May 7th, from what I've been told in Concord, uh, the plan is to allow all outside, excuse me, all inside facilities, uh, restaurants and lounges to go back to full capacity. So what I would like to see the council do is, the, is allow the outside entertainment uh, tends to be open. And I understand the concerns of some of the councilors and that is perfectly logical to be concerned. So knowing that the fire department is required all outside tents to have a limited capacity, a noted limited capacity. And every one of these tents has to have a, a gentleman or a, a lady there with a clicker counting the people that go in the tents and counting the people that go out, leave the tents so they don't exceed their capacity. If the city is concerned about uh, too many people inside of an area, they can certainly put a restriction on there, which can be, can be moved either way in the future, in the next month. Uh, let's say, again, as I said last meeting, if, a, if the tent has a 500 person capacity, the city council could say, 
at this time, we're going to set the capacity at 250 people. And the council could even go further and say, we want tables and chairs everywhere uh, if they felt that was necessary. But at least it would give the tents a chance to be open, relieve the load on the inside establishments. And again, they could set the capacity. And if things were to get better in the next month, then the capacity could be increased. Or if God forbid things get worse, the city could pull back. And I know that there are some that think, well, it, it would be unfair to have a, a merchant or a, a property owner say, gee, we let you set it up, but now we got to pull it back. Well, that's nothing new. That precedent has, been, has already been established and people would understand that. But by not doing anything, that is actually, I think, more harmful than that, uh, than not. So, so Mr. St. Clair, uh, are you saying if yep. we open up outdoor beer tents, we'll de-densify the in interior of establishments serving food and drink? I think that it, it definitely has that capacity to do that. And I might remind everybody that- the So is that, that what are, is that? I don't understand your answer. Is that a yes? We're gonna, yes, gonna de-densify? Yes. There'll be fewer yes. people in various indoor establishments if we allow outdoor beer tents. I think that's, that, that is, yes. I think that is much more plausible that that will happen. That's the logic behind my request. And again, I just wanna remind everybody that people that are doing these beer tents are in fact the, the business owners themselves uh to you know do this business so we're not it's not like we've got an outside uh person coming into town with no uh business ties to the city that, that will be doing this uh activity so we're helping the the brick and mortar if you want to talk use those terms businesses to uh maximize their business during uh motorcycle week and your your is suggestion is so long as so long as it's not at 100 percent capacity we are doing enough to mitigate um, the possibility of, of uh, transmission of, of a virus, we'll say. Well, the, according to doc, Dr. Fauci, having stuff outside is, is a good thing. And if, if people are concerned about too many people in, in a tented area, they could certainly, again, we could limit the capacity to say, okay, we, we're going we're gonna to spread it out inside the tents. Uh, if there but, is isn't, but, whole, but isn't a tent an indoor facility? It, it, it's got, the tent is going to have a roof, correct? That's correct. It's going to have the, it's going to have uh, exterior partitions that look like walls of sort, except maybe made well, of uh, well, sometimes, softer substance. Sometimes. Listen, if 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 that's where the city wants to look at that, that's fine. But you have to get a permit to have that outside tent, and those permits are what is being denied right now. So that's that's what we're talking about. I'm just trying to, again, to move things outside uh, as much as possible uh, because I think that's a good thing for every all parties concerned. Okay. Th thanks. Thanks for the clarification, Mr. St. Clair. Uh, you're welcome. It. And, and uh, again, this is something that depending, uh, depending on how things are uh, going out there in the, in the world, we can, uh, we can go on from that point. So if, if, uh, I don't expect you to speak for every one of the potential vendors, but you're talking about a percentage of capacity uh, you suggested, you know, uh, a fifty percent capacity at one point. There, would, I mean, would would the vendors be okay with ten percent capacity to start? I'm not talking about vendors on that. The vendors should be the vendor area. Should I'm talking be, about the vendors who are open, uh, uh, who are going to operate a, a beer tent. You're talking about the property owners and not okay. vendors. And 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 again, that's just my certainly not. I, I I'm quite sure all the capacity people want hundred percent. I'm just trying to let the council try to mitigate if they feel they need to mitigate. Okay. Terrific. But at least, have, at least have the tents. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Okay. Again, I appreciate your time. Well, likewise. The mayor, uh, Peter Burnett has raised his hand. Hi, Mr. Burnett. Welcome. I think you're muted. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, City Manager Myers. My name is Peter Brunat. I live at 15 Park Street in Lakeport. I am also the planning board chair, but I'm speaking in my capacity as a, a resident of Lakeport tonight. Um, as you are no doubt aware, a major redevelopment project is going on virtually at my door. Um, approximately half of the city block 
is currently uh, being excavated to make preparations for a rather sizable concrete and steel building. Um, and uh, I'm asking the city council to consider a special traffic order. Um, I called the uh, director of public works and asked him if he could post or tell the direct uh, the developers, the uh, uh, excuse me, the construction people, to uh, try to exit the property directly to Elm Street. Um, I don't know if you've been in this neighborhood recently, but there are four streets here. Um, one of which is Fourth Street. Mine, the middle one, is Park, and then there's Railroad Avenue, and they are joined at the north end by Gold Street. The corner of Lakeport Avenue and Gold Street is generally a puddle. Um, it's almost impossible to see the corner. There are no curbs, no markings, no street markings. And the marina that uh, constantly operates down that street because there's a storage facility where the uh, fire station used to be, um, they're, they're taking uh, huge forklifts on a regular basis. So basically, it's getting, the, the pavement's getting pounded. The lower half of Park Street from my property line to Gold is an absolute nightmare. Gold Street itself isn't very good. Um, I've looked at the what they're doing over there. I understand that the, right now is gonna be the heaviest truck traffic because there are 10 wheelers. Like this morning, I had a line of 10 wheelers in front of my house waiting to, uh, to, to uh, move to the site. I understand that they need to do that, but it's going to be a long time and there's going to be a lot of heavy equipment involved. So I would really appreciate it on behalf of myself and the other few remaining residents here in this little neighborhood uh, in the village of Lakeport to, uh, to issue a special traffic order, uh, uh, maybe establishing a weight limit on these four streets um, or simply just say no large vehicles beyond this point. I understand they would need to exit directly onto either Railroad Avenue or Park Street, uh, which is what they're doing right now, but it's at the lower end and they can take a left, if they come out onto Park Street and go directly to Elm. So I would ask you to do that um, on behalf of my neighborhood. And then secondly, I guess this is both as a, as a member of the public and a member of the planning board. Um, we have a tax increment financing district uh, here um, it, it hasn't been active, I don't believe, since 2017. We are trying to uh, get it um, up and running again. Um, and what we're looking at is two parts of um, the, uh, the TIF statute that might apply to this situation. One is uh, providing assistance to relocate people, something we probably should have thought about before they were displaced but I don't know how many people have been displaced by the redevelopment um, project next door to me. Um, and secondly, to uh, see if um, uh, some incentives could be provided to developers to make infrastructure improvements like for the streets and sidewalks and underground utilities, uh, both here uh, in, in this immediate area, but all within the district. Um, so, uh, when that comes before you, if that comes before you, um, I would appreciate your support for uh, for that. Um, I think it's a, and I, and I haven't really spoken at length with my city councilor about it, but I see him nodding his head. So I guess I must be in the right ballpark. And with that, I will probably to your utter amazement, stop speaking. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Burnett. And uh, Scott, when uh, you and I are out tomorrow in the city taking a look at another street, would it be possible to swing by this area uh, of roadway that Mr. Burnett is talking about? Sure, and if the council would just like to have consensus to uh, have me work with the public works director and, and the developer and just come up with a common sense approach rather than waiting a couple of weeks to bring something back to you at the next agenda, I'm happy to take the lead on that as well, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. That would be that would be great. When I uh, spoke with the director, it was the actually the last day of the the spring uh, street cl closing signs. They were all coming down that day. So, thank you. Perfect. Thanks very much. We'll we'll swing by and take a look at it tomorrow. Mr. Thank Mayor, uh, yes. Executive Councilor Joe Kenny has raised his hand. 
Welcome, uh, Executive Counselor Kenny. Glad you can be with us this evening. Thank you, uh, Mayor Hosmer. Uh, uh, nice to see all the, the counselors and to see the city manager, um, Scott Myers. I just wanted to pop in just for a few moments. Uh, I've been stopping into the town halls and select meetings and city halls just to kind of give a, a quick wrap up of what's going on at the council. Uh, first of all, um, uh, there's a tremendous lot uh, going on in Concord at this point. I just wanted to point out that we're um, in the process of hiring a new state fire marshal. Paul Parisi a couple of meetings ago uh, resigned and there's three finalists. Um, if the mayor would like, uh, I would like to bring maybe the, the fire marshal, the new fire marshal to Laconia, given that you have a lot of activity that's coming up that might require his assistance and his leadership. Um, we also um, have a lot of boards and commission positions in state government that we're looking for at this point. So anybody who's looking to become a judge, uh, see me. Uh, we're looking for judges to serve on our court systems. Um, right now, as you're aware, um, uh, the council votes on a lot of your state contracts. Um, Laconia hasn't had too much this spring. We've seen um, obviously the water revolving fund, uh, which Laconia got 1.7 million earlier this year. Uh, we've seen a lot of renewals of um, lease agreements with regards to state-owned rail property. Um, and we've seen a community development block grant of $500,000 come before the council uh, to support Sunrise Towers and Sunrise House in Laconia. But um, uh, currently we're aware that uh, the stimulus package, uh, I believe Laconia is going to receive about $1.6 million. Uh, as, as of today, I have no inkling on what the administrative rules are going to be. The only clearance that I can get from the governor's office is that um, for, for local communities and counties, it's gonna be fairly lenient. You just can't use it to offset taxes. So there should be some flexibility with that money. Um, so we hope to, uh, that those deposits will happen probably in the next three weeks. Um, we have, uh, the, uh, the tenure highway improvement plan process will start uh, later this summer. So I'll be holding a meeting uh, uh, with the city of uh, Laconia to look at the tenure highway improvement plan. Um, also just for our edification, there is a federal infrastructure plan that's still being worked on. We're fortunate that our commission of transportation, Victoria Sheehan uh, heads up AASHTO, which is the American Association of State Highways and transportation officials. So she's going to be a, a point person, both uh, here in the state, but also nationally. So hopefully um, we'll get some good information uh, from her. I uh, would also like to point out that we have a new Trails Bureau Chief, uh, Craig Rennie, who is replacing Chris Gamash. So anything to do with trail system, uh, we've got a new chief in regards to that. Um, other than that, the last point I would just point out is that uh, the Lakeshore um, Redevelopment Commission is doing a great job. Um, I guess they're meeting early in May, and uh, there's legislation in Concord that's bouncing around. I think the House has amended so that the, the sale of the state property would go through its formal process, uh, which would be going before the uh, Long Range Committee of Governor and Council, uh, but more importantly, uh, getting the input from the city and also from um, the commission itself. So with that, I open it up to any uh, questions. Uh, thanks very much, um, Councilor Kenny. Uh, I, I think you've already touched on a couple of points that are close to us. One is the um, the future of the Lakeshore Redevelopment Authority, as well as the property. It's trying to uh, enhance the value, and um, I think they've done a very good job at it. And hopefully, they're allowed to continue their work, and it goes through the more traditional processes of, um, of surplus properties, surplus state land. Um, so that's, that's I know, very important to all of us here. Certainly, we think it's a transformational piece of property and the idea of looking at it from a holistic approach as to uh, developing the entire portion or uh, not just the road frontage is, is really important to maximizing the value, but also getting it back to the tax rolls, which it hasn't been on the city of Laconia for over 100 years now. So uh, happy to have a follow-up conversation with you whenever whenever you're in town or want to reach out. Absolutely. 
And I just wanted to ask Scott, Scott, are you getting our wrap up reports from governor and council meetings? I am counselor uh, every, every two weeks, three weeks as the meeting schedule I do. And I uh, always peruse the agendas ahead of time and watch out for Laconia specific items as well, but thank you. You're welcome. And, and Mayor Hosmer, I, I will bring in the state fire marshal. So that's probably when the next time we'll meet along with anybody else who'd like to join us. Thanks. I really appreciate you bringing him here and we certainly want to work through the city manager um, and uh, the fire chief as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Councillor Lippman. Yes, uh, thank you, Councillor Kenny, for coming and uh, participating tonight. I was wondering if uh, city manager, um, with respect to the Wears Beach and the restoration of the beach, is there anything that we might want to share with Councillor Kenny with respect to uh, Department of Environmental Services, or are we all set there? Uh, I, I think we're set for the moment. That's going to start to rekindle. It's fallen on the wayside a little bit with COVID, and uh, we're looking to get that uh, restarted. Um, so certainly, you know, we'll, we'll reach out to Councillor Kenny at the appropriate time when we're working because obviously it's a very unique uh, and large scale project of beach restoration, probably not one that DES has seen the likes of. So it's uh, probably going to be some new ground for them as well. But uh, absolutely, we'll, we'll reach out to Councillor Kenny and, and um, bring him up to speed and um, have them participate uh, where possible. Remember, it doesn't have to take Motorcycle Weekend to get me over there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Councillor Kenny? Seeing none, again, thank you very much, Councillor, for joining us. Look forward to seeing you face to face sometime soon. The Mayor, Jose D'Amatos has raised his hand. Mr. D'Amatos, welcome. Good evening, everyone. Jose D'Amatos, 1192, 1198 Wears Boulevard. Channel Waterfront Cottages and Wears Beach Convenience and Gifts. I'm here to urge all our city councilors and mayor to fully reopen Laconia Motorcycle Week this June to 100% of the vendors and allowing outdoor entertainment vendors. Just this afternoon, the CDC ended their recommendation on even wearing fat face masks outdoors. The current seven day moving average of daily cases has decreased 10.1% compared with the previous seven day moving average. Compared to the highest peak on January 8th, the current seven day average has decreased 74.9%. Our New Hampshire Governor Sununu is going to be announcing full capacity in all restaurants, bars and lounges very soon. The outdoors are much safer than forcing everyone inside. Vendors at 100% is going to allow the city also the potential to maximize the vendor fee revenue, thus offsetting the expenses. At 50% of vendors, this will not occur. Please allow visitors to make their own decisions, whether they choose to or not to go into a vendor or even attend the event. I know that the public and your constituents have reached out to you and have overwhelmingly want 100% vendors and entertainment. You have wisely allowed Wake the Lake and should also please allow the vendors at 100% entertainment and beer tents. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. D'Amatos. Mr. Mayor, Brian Lange has raised his hand. I just to, to be cognizant of the uh, time, uh, this is a very uh, robust agenda for the city council tonight with um, the proposed uh, budget. Um, it's on the agenda. So I, I just want to make sure the comments are coming from uh, people who are residents of the city. And I want to be uh, hold you to three minutes maximum. And please try not to repeat what other people have said. Um, Anyway, go right ahead, Mr. Lang. Uh, thank you, councilors, Mr. Mayor, um, city manager. Um, I would like to state first and foremost, uh, now that you have said that, um, I am not actually a resident of Laconia. I'm someone who is a resident of New Hampshire. I frequent Laconia and the Weirs Beach area, and I have since I was a child. Um, if you would like me to hold my comments now that you've put in those stipulations, I would be happy to do so. Um, Just please, if, I, if you could keep them brief, Mr. Lang, that's all I ask. 
Yes, absolutely. Um, so recently it has come to my attention that there are active um, neo-Nazi and white supremacist hate groups that are becoming more and more active in New England and in, um, especially in New Hampshire and Maine. And recently it came to my attention that um, this specific neo-Nazi and white supremacist hate group known as the National uh, the Nationalist Social Club of New England, who is known to the ADL and the FBI to have taken part in numerous violent acts and even the Capitol insurrection that happened on January 6th. Um, they recently, as of April 16th, were posting up their neo-Nazi and white supremacist propaganda along Weir's Beach and in Laconia. And I just wanted to make the city councilors, the mayor, and any members of the public who might be listening to be aware of this and to look towards the future and the summer and bike week with all of these people and tourists and um, you know, just the, the, the greater community that we want to invite to New Hampshire and be able to feel welcome and safe and enjoy the beauty here. Um, I just want to bring awareness that they are active. They are out here trying to recruit in your community and communities that every New Hampshireite shares together and to actively, um, just just know that these groups are within our communities and to stand against them. Um, I, I would ask that the Laconia Police Department looks into these acts and that the, the city council just makes a statement, you know, condemning um, this type of racism and virulent hatred that is rearing its head within your community. Thank you, Mr. Lang, so noted. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, uh, no other hands are raised. Thank you. Um, moving on, on to our agenda here. Uh, City Manager, if you just give me a little direction here, we're sticking to the agenda as printed here, correct? What's throwing me off is the 715 uh, um, non-public I saw at one point there. No, we're staying for That was just for um, reprogramming the Zoom, the, uh, the iPads or tablets for people from the airport meeting at 615. We we're reusing those for the non-public after we just had to give it an awkward start time. But no, we're, we're just straight through on this regular agenda, yes. Okay, that's all it took to throw me off. Not much, but thank you. Uh, moving along to number 11, uh, under nominations and appointments and elections, um, Brett Beliveau is re requesting appointment as a regular member of the planning board to fill the remainder of a term expiring at the end of June 2023. Mr. Beliveau is currently an alternate on the planning board, having served in the capacity for the past three years. He's applying to fill the remainder of a three-year term created by the resignation of former planning board member Jewel Fox. Interviews of individuals applying for appointment or reappointment to various boards and commissions were held uh, at the council's April 12, 20, April 12, 2021 meeting. Appointments will be made at this evening's meeting. Mr. Bellavo's application was included in the April 12, 2021 agenda. Uh, right now, I'll be looking for a motion to uh, appoint Brett Bellavo as a regular member of the planning board to fill the remainder of a term expiring at the end of June. 2023. So made by Councillor Cheney, seconded by Councillor Hamill. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Councillor Cheney? Yes. Councillor Susie? You're muted. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Littman? Yes. Councillor Haynes? Yes. Councillor Hamill? Yes. Councillor Felch. Yes. A six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. Congratulations, uh, Mr. Beliveau, and thank you for your willingness to serve. Moving along to item number 13 under public hearings. Public hearing for resolution 2021-05 relative to a proposed land swap and boundary line adjustment between Antaeus Holdings Limited and the city of Laconia and declaration of a portion of the city's portion of the city's property at tax map 367-189-24 is surplus. Notice of this public hearing was made available on April in the April 14th, 2021 edition of the Laconia Daily Sun, posted at Laconia City Hall, Laconia Public Library, Community Center, and the SAU. Action on this item will be taken up under unfinished business. 
So I'd like to open the public hearing at 7.40 p.m. And if um, anyone in the public would like to address this matter, now would be the appropriate time. Mr. Mayor, we, yes. we do have a hand up. Uh, the hand up went up right after we closed citizen comments. So <laughs> I'm not sure if it's for this or not. Well, why don't we find out if it is? Um, okay. This is Megan. Megan, is this in regards to the public hearing for the resolution? Apparently not. So I will declare the public the public hearing closed at 7:41 p.m. Moving along to number 14 under presentations, uh, 14A, which is the fiscal year 2022 budget presentation. And uh, welcome again, City Manager Myers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, I know the mayor and councilors all received copies of the budget in their mailbox on a Friday afternoon. So I'm sure you were all busy all weekend long going through every page and you don't have any questions, but tonight is just gonna be a, uh, a highlight overview of the budget, uh, what's driving it, uh, how it went together this year under very unusual times, um, some of the unknowns that we'll be monitoring over the next couple of months. Um, and as you've all seen a, uh, a schedule of department head presentations or dates anyway, and I'll be filling those in with the department heads and already have, and hopefully we'll be getting you a, uh, a full calendar of not only those dates, but what departments will be presenting on those dates um, for you in short order. So we will have a busy uh, month of May and into June on even our off Monday nights for some uh, budget information. Um, for folks at home, uh, this, this document will be posted, uh, the budget document will be posted online as of tomorrow morning, uh, www.laconianh.gov. There will be a copy in the library. There also will be a copy in the city clerk's office. I've got Glenn Smith sharing a screen with a PowerPoint presentation, which will probably run through somewhere probably less than 10 minutes of the budget overview. And um, then we'll move on to other items on the agenda. So as you can see, as the mayor said, this is the revenue and expenditure plan for fiscal year uh, 2022. Um, next slide. Um, a number of unknown pieces. Uh, Councillor Kenny, uh, Executive Councillor Kenny hit on it a few minutes ago when he spoke about some of the funds that might be available through the American Rescue Act plan. And we're still waiting for guidance from the US Treasury Department on what those funds may or may not be allowed to be used for. Backfilling lost revenue, um, supporting small businesses, supporting nonprofits, supporting travel and tourism. Um, a number of things that uh, we have questions on, and when I say we, collectively, municipalities and counties across the state. So that is one of our unknowns right now. Uh, the second one is it's a, it's a state budget year for the biennium budget. So the House of Representatives uh, has taken the governor's proposed budget. Governor Sununu came out with his budget in February. Uh, the House worked on it through uh, crossover day, somewhere around the first week of April this year, I believe um, they approved the budget at the, at the House level and moved it over to the Senate. The Senate always, because of the timing of it, has the benefit of working on the budget later in the cycle, and therefore they have an opportunity to have additional information in terms of revenue updates on, on how the state is performing um, through business profits tax, through rooms and meals, through gas tax, alcohol sales, tobacco sales, and a number of other revenue streams that uh, you can imagine have been significantly impacted over the past 12 months for obvious reasons. Um, you know, I, I say at some of my uh, department head meetings that, you know, gas tax is down this year. That's the, that's the you know, gas tax built into the, the gallons of fuel that people buy when everybody was working from home or businesses and schools were shut down last spring for a, a good period of time. Um, we also had rooms and meals revenue was impacted significantly early on in this pandemic, um, has rebounded now, and, and there's a good possibility that the April numbers will actually meet projections for the first time in, in about a year right now. Um, ironically or not, uh, the two taxes that have um, exceeded revenue expectations are the alcohol tax and the tobacco tax. 
Um, so if you want to know what everybody's been doing these past 12 months, that might give you a little bit of a, of a leading indicator. So we are waiting for the Senate to work through um, their budget uh, and then go back and reconcile with the House. And we'll certainly be monitoring that closely for some of those revenue sharings of the, of the road um, funds that we get through the gas tax, also the rooms and meals distribution. Um, the prior two-year budget had almost $400,000 to Laconia each year in revenue sharing. Uh, that is not in the governor's proposed budget and at this point is not in the House budget. So we are awaiting uh, those types of details to see what may come and then what opportunities there may be, be to backfill some revenues from the American Rescue Act plan, which President Biden signed into law uh, about six or seven weeks ago. So um, those are a couple of unknowns that obviously COVID is still with us. We still have impacts on finances, on operations, on PPE, on extra cleaning and sanitizing. Um, and then we have to look at what possible expenses and or reimbursements may be available to us, um, even though COVID is, is um, is winding down to some extent where more people are getting vaccinated. There are still variant strains. Um, there are still some, you know, regional and local um, outbreaks as, as you've heard and read in the local papers recently. So um, we feel confident that we presented a very solid budget. There'll just be a few puzzle pieces that we may have to plug in along the way um, as we know more. Next slide, Glenn. So what does the budget contain? It contains major categories, are obviously our revenue projections, uh, the city appropriations. So what's the city expenses going to be for the next 12 months? Same thing on the school department side, their appropriation. We have the state property tax assessment, which is the state education uh, tax as well. And then we have the Delknap County tax assessment. So all of those components go into it. Uh, it it uh, provides for the amount of revenue that we raise outside of property taxes and then the amount of revenue that we need to collect from property owners through property taxes. Next slide. Uh, along with all the city operations, uh, a few enterprise funds, so the water department budget, sewer budget are found in there, the internal service fund, which handles all the vehicle purchases, maintenance, repairs, and cost um, is in there as well. Motorcycle week fund, uh, the three tax increment financing districts, both for, or for the downtown, Lakeport, and the Weirs. And also the ambulance EMS fund is set up as a special revenue fund where we track the expenses and they're offset by the revenue. Next slide. So this budget, like uh, most budgets I presented to you over the last 10 years, focuses on a couple of core areas. Number one, public safety. Second, education, uh, infrastructure and maintenance of our bridges, buildings, roads, and then providing uh, a safe and, and affordable uh, and quality water and sewer services. So this budget is really no different um, this year than it has been in past years. We are a tax cap community. Uh, next slide, Glenn. Um, so we are limited in the amount that can be raised through property taxes by two components every year. Uh, the first one is the inflation number, the consumer price index number, and that's based on a calendar year 2021. Uh, that number came in at a very small uh, level this year at 1.2% for inflation. Uh, basically, when COVID came in, in in March and shut things down, the demand for goods and raw materials and, and people's incomes were impacted. So therefore, spending was impacted right away. Um, so we saw all inflation immediately drop down basically to a, to a zero or slightly above zero level. Um, did start to tick up right at the end of the year. But again, for calendar year, we're at 1.2%, which uh, that part on its own does not allow for a whole lot of growth within the budget. New construction value was a very positive surprise this year. We saw uh, a lot of people who were staying at home, not only doing some smaller do-it-yourself projects, but um, people doing some larger projects. Um, some people looking to uh, relocate to New Hampshire for quality of life and, and getting out of cities and moving to more rural sections and coming in and investing in properties uh, and doing improving, in some cases, tearing down and rebuilding. And we also saw a couple of large projects uh, pull permits, including the, um, the reuse of the Barton's motel space, um, also the Colonial Theater uh, residential component of it, uh, and then a variety of some new you know, starter homes for folks who are just um, you know, trying to save up to do a first home purchase and some million dollar waterfront property. So it really was a mix across the board, uh, but to put it in perspective that $39 million uh, more than doubled uh, the figure that we used last year at this time. So the value of those building permits at our current tax rate 
allows for the additional spending of the 769,000 that you see there. Next slide, please, Glenn. So first and foremost, in big letters, this is a tax cap compliant budget. So the proposed increase in terms of the amount raised in property taxes is 1.2%. Uh, next slide, by function, uh, that means to stay within the cap, city spending on uh, increase on property taxes can exceed the 522,000 figure on the school side, 732,000. And if the county were subject to our tax cap, um, 81,000, even though the county is not limited by our tax cap, uh, as your manager, I'm required to, uh, to put the county component into the overall budget, uh, which it is a part of, and our overall budget does need to be compliant um, with the tax cap. Next slide. So overall on the city side, spending increases by uh, about a million 250 of 4.5% over the current year. School department spending, uh, excluding the federal and food service funds increases by a million 69,000. Uh, the Belknap County tax assessment decreased by a little over 300,000. And we're projecting our revenues to increase um, non-property tax revenues to increase by approximately 327,000. And as I had already mentioned, the assessed valuation at a $39 million increase. Next slide. So what's driving the budget? Uh, wages, we have four collective bargaining, bargaining uh, units, and we also have a, a large component of non-union employees who work for the city. Um, so wages, uh, as the council is aware, with a couple of contracts you've approved already, and including one item on the agenda before you tonight, uh, you've agreed to a 1.8% increase, um, cost of living increase in one year, in two separate one-year contracts that you've approved for the AFSME group and the SEA group. So um, budget uh, for those who are entitled to steps in the wages uh, on, the, on the wage scale that they're on um, includes steps. It also includes a 1.8% cost of living adjustment. Health insurance came in uh, relatively low for a health insurance increase. I mean, no increase is better than having an increase, but 3.3% uh, was the increase on our insurance and our employees contribute depending on which plan they partake of either 10% of the cost or 15% of the cost. New Hampshire retirement system really took a, a big chunk of, uh, of our available cap space this year. Um, the retirement system, and I know we touched upon this a few weeks back, so I won't belabor it, but um, uh, made a major uh, a change in um, how they project what the returns are gonna be over the next 10, 15, 20 years and using their actuarial statistics and working with uh, the, the financial uh, money fund managers who manage the $10 billion plus that's in the retirement system. Um, and as everybody knows, interest rates are at historic lows and um, that's great if you're borrowing, it's not great if you need to, to receive income on a fixed income or through bonds or something like that. So within the retirement system portfolio, uh, the, the fixed income or the bond portion is not generating anywhere near what historically it has done. So therefore the board of directors and full disclosure, I do serve on the New Hampshire Retirement System Board of Trustees, uh, made a decision to reduce our resumed rate of return of the overall assets on an annual basis from the level of 7.25% to a level of 6.75%. So when you calculated that new assumption into the components of rate setting, uh, it caused a rate increase because across the system, we are not assuming that the return is going to be as high as it once was. So that did drive rates on the city side alone, not the school. The increase was somewhere between 300 dollars and $400,000 across uh, all employees who are part of the retirement system. And that basically is um, just about everybody. Um, capital outlay in the budget, uh, we did have a slight increase. Again, we try to, to fund a number of capital projects with cash so that we can um, be maintaining a healthy ratio of cash purchases for capital items in the operating budget and not putting everything on the credit card, not debt financing. That makes uh, long-term strategic sense. Uh, we do borrow and bond uh, money for large projects where it makes sense, uh, but for some of the smaller recurring ones, paying cash is a prudent approach. So uh, there is a small increase in capital. We do have uh, the debt financing for the Elm Street uh, Lakeport project. Um, Councillor Kenny had mentioned we had gotten a loan through the state uh, water revolving loan fund for the water component of it there. Um, 
other priorities that uh, that took a, a, a large portion of the budget this year, the Colonial Theater. As you know, we were anticipated taking ownership of it um, as of January this year. So when you think about it, part of the cost of the Colonial were built into the budget that we're currently in and part of the cost for the Colonial coming up in next year's budget. So for items like uh, the rent payments to Belknap EDC and the operating expenses of light, heat, insurance, cleaning, uh, spectacle uh, management company, all of those need to be built into the budget uh, that you have before you now. The big piece of that was basically a lot of the debt service hit in the fiscal year beginning July 1. Um, we had a small amount that was due in this fiscal year. It basically was a partial interest payment uh, in coinciding with when the bond was issued, but a large component. So the colonial and retirement system um, really, really took up uh, a lot of our, our cap space this year, uh, made it for a challenging budget year. Um, priority of the council is our field maintenance, taking care of our ball fields, our parks and everything. When we get to those particular department, that particular department, you'll see some increases in how we're structuring it there to be um, being more aggressive with our, our field and park maintenance. Next slide, please, Glenn. Touched upon a few of these things, but um, you know, increases either in rooms and meals. Um, we're hoping that the highway block grant distribution will be made whole in, in the budget. Also, some of the federal COVID funds to come in and backfill some lost revenues. We've still seen strong increase in motor vehicle registration. So we've even uh, adjusted that and done a small increase for next year's projection. Um, building and zoning, we talked about uh, a lot of projects in the work, so that was bumped up a little bit. We do have a one-time return of surplus through our pooled uh, health insurance group, New Hampshire Interlocal Trust. So we budgeted some dollars that we anticipate receiving in fiscal year 22. Um, our parking meter revenue last year was very strong. We bumped up that line item a little bit. And we continue to wean ourselves of the use of fund balance, albeit this year uh, a relatively small reduction and maybe just more of a token to keep us on a path of what I think is, is steady prudence and congratulations to the council for eight or nine years in a row of reducing the use of fund balance, which at one time uh, was over $1.1 million, um, which has to be made up with new revenue coming in to flow back into fund balance. Um, so it's good to try to wean ourselves down from that. And, and if approved within the budget as presented, we'll be down to a level of only $700,000 starting July 1. Next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, we will be... Um, you know, working through with some additional recommendations once some more information comes out on budgets and, and federal dollars and how everything comes together. Um, with existing dollars, we're going to be making a recommendation to reallocate some surplus and in health insurance funds this year to some of the capital needs that I was not able to fund within the budget. Um, looking to move some of the dollars that you just transferred out of the school teacher stabilization fund that the city held for a couple of years. And we just recently moved to the non-capital reserve account again, to fund some smaller capital projects that we're not able to fit into the budget for reasons I've mentioned. And then we'll have some of the routine carry forward recommendations that we do every year um, for some projects that are, are midstream or maybe haven't started yet, but we still are looking to do sometime later this calendar year. Next slide, Glenn. Again, starting tomorrow morning, the budget can be found on the website, a print copy available in the library or the city clerk's office. Uh, next slide. Uh, I mentioned we'll be working through department head presentations. So the school is our first one up on May 10th. And then other department heads will be presenting their budgets and giving you more detailed uh, information. And we certainly welcome the uh, and, and, and request the input and, and guidance and direction from the mayor and the city council, along with all of our residents to take part, public hearings, citizen comment opportunities, emails. Um, we really welcome and encourage the participation. And the last slide is just to thank you to everybody who worked on the budget, um, my department heads in particular, but also the Laconia School Board does yeoman's work with the school administration. And then uh, compiling everything together um, is our finance director, Glenn Smith. And uh, he really ties it all out and uh, puts together a great document for us to work on. So thank you to Glenn. So I can stop there and uh, take any questions of the general nature if anybody has any. Thanks very much, Scott and Glenn and, and your respective teams and putting together this comprehensive budget that uh, um, I look forward to going through over the next few meetings. I think it's uh, really a terrific deep dive uh, into city finances. 
So um, thanks again. I'll look to my fellow counselors right now. Any questions or feedback at this point? Counselor Susan. Yeah, just one quick question, Scott. Will it be, when will you be issuing a calendar for us to, to? I think I sent one out at the end of last week with dates and times, and um, I'm working with department heads to plug in. So I can resend that. I'm probably going to resend it to you by uh, hopefully by Wednesday of this week with the blanks filled in. But um, I'll, I'll make sure you got the, the first one, and then we'll we'll plug in the dates. But um, basically, the, the, the first presentation will be at a six o'clock start on our next meeting. So May 10th, we'll be starting at six o'clock and that will be with the school department and they will present uh, between six and seven. And at seven, we will go into our regular um, meeting start time, but I will make sure everybody has the updated um, calendar uh, no later than Wednesday of this week. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Councilor Susie. Councilor Lippman, uh, are, are you raising your hand to speak? Yes, please, thank you. Please. Um, so I guess, one of the things I want to talk to with the full council here and the manager, I assume would agree with this, that um, based on this being a state budget year that we would want to uh, consider taking our vote as late as possible to incorporate all of the understanding of the state budget and its influence on our budget. Um, can you uh, refresh us, uh, uh, Mr. Manager, about uh, what date that might be? Um, Sure. So that's so that's on the bottom of the document. Hold on one second there. Um, Megan, you could you mute uh, your device, uh, perhaps. Um, Glenn, so Glenn, you can mute that uh, mute that as well, please. It should be all set. Thank you. Yes, Council Lippman. So on the document that I sent out with a schedule at the bottom uh, also includes when we would be holding a first reading of the public hearing and then holding the public hearing in a second, I'm sorry, I'm sorry of the budget um, documents and then holding the public hearing and then have a second reading of the budget documents. That will occur uh, on, on the June 14th meeting, but no action needs to be taken um, it's a procedural to be able to, to have the public hearings, allow the public to chime in. So um, our, our schedule of department head press presentations runs through, runs through our meeting on our regular meeting date of June 14th. Um, we've scheduled a special budget meeting just to focus on, you know, solely on what you've heard, your questions, your proposed amendments to the budget for June 21st. And then we have one of three potential budget adoption dates, which could be June 28th, July 8th, and July 22nd. So it's all listed there. And by charter, the council can adopt the budget as late as the fourth Monday in July, which would be that July 22nd date. Uh, we do start a fiscal year on July 1. It would be business as usual. The only thing that I, as your city manager, would not release and make funds available for it would be any of the capital items because I'd want to make sure that they were contained in the final budget. But a, a wait of three weeks past the start of the fiscal year is um, is really insignificant in terms of releasing those dollars on the capital project. So um, th those those are the dates that we're looking at, Council Lemon. On the, the June 21st date, I think that the final committee of conference at a state level is like June 24th. And if we want to um, plan around when we know what the um, that's going to be, as opposed to having to wait till the second one in July, maybe before the end of the month, have another special meeting. Yeah, so the June 21st would be a special meeting. June 28th is a regular meeting date for us as well. Um, so we have an opportunity to address whatever might happen there. So this, the, the schedule could be very flexible. So depending on what happens with the legislature and the budget and uh, how everything shakes out there, um, we can be flexible in amending it. Um, we are, like I say, we're, we're scheduled, you know, somewhat firmly um, to have the department head presentations completed by June 14th. But beyond there, we can be as flexible as we need to. Um, in terms of the, um, both the American Rescue Plan um, funds and the um, and potential um, valuation increases beyond what's assumed so far. Could you just comment on those two things a little bit more, please? 
Yeah, so the American Rescue Fund, um, as Councilor Kenny mentioned, I think the city is slated to receive somewhere in the ballpark of $1.6 million. That can be used for COVID-related expenses. It could be used to support economic development, travel tourism initiatives. We believe it's going to be allowed to backfill um, revenue shortfalls from the last full year that we had. So the timing of the timing of the of the pandemic part of it hit in fiscal year. 20 and a continuation in the fiscal year 21. So we'd be looking back to the last full unimpacted year of fiscal year 19 for revenues. So I think I mentioned a couple of meetings ago, or maybe it was the last meeting, for instance, our ambulance revenue really took a hit the last 12 months and just people not choosing to call 911 or not choose to go to the hospital. Um, you know, so if there's an opportunity to make up for some of the revenue um, that we didn't realize um, in the up coming state budget, you know, we could be impacted on, you know, the rooms and meals, or we could be impacted on the gas tax distribution uh, for the reasons I've already mentioned. So the American Cares Act might be able to come back, back and backfill revenue shortfalls there. Um, the, the revenue sharing that we received, all municipalities received from the state the last two years, again, Laconia was about 392,000 a year. There might be an opportunity to, to backfill that loss in state uh, revenue sharing um, over this budget or the next budget. Uh, the language states that the funds, uh, Glenn helped me out. I wanna say they need to be expended by the end, December 31st of 2024, 2024 is the year. So we, we don't have to rush. We can look at what makes sense now and, and how we might map it in, uh, phase it in over the next couple of years, because obviously as, as you all know, it's a two-year state budget. So whatever the impact is, good or bad, in year one, it's a similar impact in year two. So we do have some flexibility with these funds for about uh, two and a half years. And, and these are the funds I'm referring to from the American Rescue Act. Um, and the second second part of your question, Councilor Lipson, I forget. The, the, the valuation um, that we base it on now versus what might come to pass. Sure, sure. So as we all know, the real estate market has been has been very hot. Um, and while we have $39 million in new building permit value, and similar last year, we had around 19 million. As you recall, when the auditors presented the final statistical update back in the fall, and what the valuation was that we were using in our tax rate setting, we were up around $150 million just due to market driven conditions. So that made the tax rate go down, which is always good. People like to hear the tax rate goes down, but all of our properties collectively, all things being equal, increased in value. So therefore you had more thousands in value on your property to pay taxes on, but the tax rate went down. So you'll probably hear me say a few times along the way, the, the tax rate means nothing because whatever tax rate you end up adopting in June or July, we won't have done the statistical update yet. And chances are beyond the $39 million in new value that we believe will come online just from the building permits, there'll be value that's just generated from a strong real estate market um, when they do the comps on the sales and they, and they adjust certain types of properties in certain neighborhoods and residential and commercial and everything in between. So um, expectation is that we would see an increase of more than $39 million in our total citywide assessed valuation next fall when we start working with the Department of Revenue Administration to set the tax rate um, far too soon to know what that is because the assessing year just closed on March 31st and that's where they kind of draw the line in the sand. So assessors, you know, that end of March, 1st of April are going out and looking at construction projects. So if you've got a house that's halfway completed on April 1st, we're trying to capture the value of what a half completed house is worth at that time. You know, if you've got something that's 90% complete, certainly we're going to capture that versus something that just might be a foundation in the ground. So you've got to pick a line somewhere, a date somewhere, and that's that April 1st date. So we kind of go out in and snap pictures and do a lot of legwork right now. And then our assessors will start looking at all of the sales that have occurred over the past 12 months and compare them to uh, you know, other neighborhoods, other properties, and really you know, work through a lot of iterations to come up with new assessed valuations that will be um, coming out with the, with the tax bills the second half of the year. So the November tax bill that's due in December. So um, yes, but we would expect, uh, you know, Mike Cristobal says, yes, definitely an uptick in the assessed valuation citywide again this year. 
Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lippman. Any other questions or comments for city manager at this time? Seeing none, I, again, thanks, Scott. I will um, uh, offer up my time under the mayor's report right now because we do have a, a pretty significant agenda. So I'm happy to move right along to council comments at number 16 on our agenda. Do you have any council comments this evening? Seeing none, uh, do we have any committee reports? Um, under number 18, do we have any liaison reports this evening? Seeing none, I'll move right along then to number 19 for citizens request to comment on current agenda items. Uh, this is an opportunity for Laconia citizens um, to speak about current agenda items, I would request uh, uh, when possible to not repeat what's already been said if you're concentrating on a certain topic. And um, we're gonna try and keep our comments or your comments to three minutes. So um, I'll wait on your cue, Mr. Smith. Mr. Mayor, Charlie St. Clair has raised his hand. Mr. St. Clair. Good, uh, thank you very much. Uh, quickly, uh, I hope that the council will consider having the motorcycle week traffic plan the same as it was two years ago. Uh, again, I feel with the crowds that we expect, the traffic we expect, uh, it would be uh, much safer to have everybody going one way, not exiting back out on Route 3, and also to uh, have as much parking available as we can for our visitors on motorcycles without a mix of cars. Uh, and to also have the center line parking. Um, that's it. Thank you for your time and thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Sinclair. Mayor, Megan has raised her hand. Welcome, Megan. Hello. Welcome. Uh, good evening. Well, it's, it's our opinion that people are coming no matter what, they're coming. So Megan, can I ask you to keep your comments to an agenda item at this point? If there's an item on the agenda, maybe reference it so we know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, I'm sorry, Motorcycle Week. Which item on the agenda? Um, well, I would like to, I raised my hand for not on the agenda, but I wasn't called, so I must have been missed. But I wanted to talk about the uh, having center line parking and the traffic pattern. Okay. So, um, like we had it two years ago. It would mean a lot to us and all the local businesses, and more importantly, to the safety of all of who are attending. Um, if you don't mind if I say something about the other thing, because I wasn't called. I'd Why like don't to. we keep the, if you could, I'm sorry, Megan, but if we can keep our remarks to items on the agenda at this point, that would be appreciated and allow us to get through the agenda in a timely fashion. Okay, my hand must have been missed, but okay. My apologies. It would, be, it would just it would just mean a lot to, for to us to have uh, the center line parking and the traffic pattern like before. Terrific. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for taking the time to comment on the issue, Megan. I appreciate it. You're welcome. The mayor, Lynn, has raised Lynn. Welcome, Lynn. If you could introduce yourself and um, let us know where in the city you live. Sure, Lynn Bjorkman on uh, Wentworth Cove Road. Oh, terrific. Um, Glad you could join us. Thank you. Um, Tony Felch, Councillor Felch, had spoken to us. And I'm actually one of the property owners that's been affected by the new no parking signs. Uh, I wasn't aware of this until they went up. Um, I'm at 100, which is directly at the end of the, uh, where 91 is the last one. And it's prohibited on both sides. I'm a little confused as to why they went up. Um, I've heard rumors that there was a parking problem. Um, I think you're familiar with the area. It's a very wide road. I bought the property. I'd love to be able to have company over and this was not part of the agenda that I had anticipated. I guess there's a proposal that if we could limit it to one side, I'm not sure why we did what we did for a double-sided parking. 
I mean, is this something for discussion? I don't want to berate the point. Um, I take my advisement from you as to how we should proceed. Uh, well, it is an item on the agenda, and I think it will be addressed at, at that point, but certainly your, your opposition to it, I hear you loud and clear, though. Should, uh, do you, should I defer it to the later part of the agenda? I didn't realize. I thought it was in 19. Um, but yeah, well, the, we are on number 19, and I take it you're commenting on an item on tonight's agenda, which is under number 21E. Oh, so, I'm sorry. My, my no, you're doing great. This is, this is the appropriate that. time for you to speak up, Lynn. Okay, perfect. Um, I don't see a reason for there to be limited parking on both sides. I know it's a beach access issue. There's a, a vacant lot across the street from the beach, which seems to be the genesis of this issue. Um, and I'm proposing strongly to, to deny no parking on both sides and limit it to one side of the road. Terrific, thank you very much for joining us, Lynn, and weighing in on the issue, I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Okay. Mr. Mayor, Jose D'Amatos has raised his hand. Welcome again, Mr. D'Amatos. Mr. D'Amatos, are you with us? Is unmuted. Mr. Smith, we may have a technical difficulty on this end there, maybe? I, I show that he's unmuted, so I think we're all set on this end. I'm not sure something might be happening on the other side. Okay. Is there yeah. anyone else, while we get that resolved, is there anyone else with his or her hand up? Yes, uh, Sandra has raised her hand. Okay, why don't we go to Sandra. Welcome, Sandra. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. My name is Sandra Wettergreen. I live at 24 Woodvale Drive. And oh. as Lynn, um, who just pre previously spoke, I am also a part of that beach access on Wentworth Cove Road. There's actually 44 homeowners who have that ability to use that. And I would just like to convey to the council that there are members and people who live in the community there who live upwards of a mile from that beach. And it's a hardship for us to get down there if we're not able to park. That we have disabilities, we have cancers, we have young people, we have elderly people, we have families who have to get children down there. And the taking away that ability to park really hinders our ability to be able to use that area. So I would like you to consider, as Lynn stated, um, possibly having the parking on one side of the road. Thank you very much, Sandra. I appreciate you joining us and weighing in on this issue. Thanks. Hi, Jose D'Amatos here. Can you have me now? I can hear you now, Mr. D'Amatos. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to uh, bring up very quickly uh, the guidance on the temporary traffic order for Motorcycle Week event to be held June 12th uh, through the 20th. I fully support that the council accept this traffic order as it has been for many years for everyone's safety and convenience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other requests, Mr. Smith? Oh. Yes, R. Nato has raised her hand. Mayor. Attorney Nato, is that you? Okay, hello? Attorney Nato, is that you? Yes, hello, could you hear me? Very well, welcome, nice to have you. Thank you very much. Um, you folks were generous enough with your time a couple months ago regarding this matter, but I really think it's important to give a little more background to what's going on. Uh, there's no disagreement that this area of 45 to 50 parcels of land were granted a right of way on Wentworth Cove Road. There's no dispute there. And I represent a handful of the owners that are on that road and it hasn't been a problem 
up until about the past five to eight years. But what nobody seems to be talking about is this has been an ordinance that has been in effect since 1975. What we were asking was to enforce this ordinance, especially around where my client's houses are. So rather than try to give my clients who have, you know, had every right to en enjoy what their families have enjoyed for all these years, the proposal on the table tonight is to actually do a 180 from what the ordinance has said for 50 years. And I don't see that there's any impelling public need to do that. It worked fine up until five years ago. Um, people can certainly drop off there. But the other problem which I raised the other night was that there are people coming that have nothing to do with this subdivision. And my clients have witnessed it. They've spoken to people from Alton and they've spoken to people from Wolfboro. So this would be similar to going into any small neighborhood and just saying, we're go going to open this up now after 50 years and we're going to allow all this parking and what you and your families had enjoyed. I mean, a lot of these people, you know, their parents owned these homes. And now what we're talking about is bumper to bumper parking. Uh, some people are residents of the subdivision, some are not. But it re really seems unfair to open this up to a type of public area in such a remote area of the city. And it does adversely affect my clients use and enjoyment of their property and the value of their properties. Uh, uh, Attorney Nato, and how many uh, people do you represent in that uh, area? I represent the owners of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven parcels of land. Okay. Um, and especially within the area that, that we asked for the no parking signs. But it, it, it's just interesting that um, this road specifically was designated for no parking. And yet the other roads within this subdivision, you are allowed to park on. So there was clearly, you know, a mindset back then to avoid this exact problem. And again, it worked fine for years. Um, it, it just, to me, doesn't make sense if you can think of any of your, your places where your homes are, where it's been posted for no, no, no parking, to then turn it into a, a place that could actually park based on what this proposal is. All right, in the, in the um, uh, respect of time for others who might wanna speak, I'm, I'm gonna cut you off right there, but I certainly appreciate you weighing in uh, sure. and letting us know your, um, uh, your position in regards to this issue. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Mayor, Rich McNeil has raised his hand. Ms. Uh, Rich McNeil, welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you quite well. Whereabouts are you calling from? Okay, my name is Rich McNeil. I'm a resident of 47 Rolling Lane in the Wentworth Cove Association in the old days. Um, and I have deeded access to the right of way at the beach that everybody seems to have an issue with. Um, and I guess I have a little concern because in the last two weeks, um, I've driven through there frequently and tried to access the right away and couldn't because the landscape, commercial landscape folks that were working on clients on both sides of this right away had blocked the right away with multiple vehicles parked in the street. So if we're going to have no parking down there, will this affect commercial vehicles? That's, that's I, my I, I, Sir, I, I can't answer that at this point. I'm not sure who can, but maybe wait until the time when the issue comes up for discussion later on in the meeting. Do uh, you have any other comments you'd like to make? No, that, I, my only fear in this is this could turn into a huge issue with as far as enforcement. If, if I can't access that for because a commercial 
landscaper has been there for four hours in front of someone abutting this right away that lives there. Um, that to me is you've just affected what I paid taxes on for a deeded right away. Certainly. And I would suggest maybe a proper yeah, recourse that perhaps a proper recourse at that point would be to uh, the police department for a non-emergency matter, maybe able to enforce something. But yeah, I certainly hear what you're saying. I'll just make one more comment. Um, rather interesting now that all this has come to light in the Manchester Union leader on Wednesday, April 21st, 2021, an article, Dublin considers parking ban at Lake. Um, and the claim seems to be that the lakefront owners do not want local residents to access the town beach anymore. And I quote, uh, the vice chairman of the planning, planning board made the comment, there are those who want to privatize the lake and shut it down. Basically, no peasants allowed. I hope we're not headed that way with this one. Appreciate your input, Mr. McNeil. Thank you very much. Thank you. To Mayor, Patty Morris has raised her hand. Uh, Patty Morris, thanks for joining us. If you could let us know where you're calling from. Uh, yes, actually I'm calling from um, Woodville Drive as well. I live at 24 Woodville Drive in Laconia. Um, and I just purchased our home back in 2015 with my sister who actually happened to speak a few minutes ago, Sandra. And we have grandchildren that come up and stay at our home. And I have a one-year-old grandchild, a three-year-old grandchild and a six-year-old grandchild. And with the no parking down there, it's just about impossible for us to be able to get down to our beach rights, which again was a huge factor for us to move into the community. We've been coming up to Laconia for over 30 years with our family. And five years ago, we made, almost six years ago now, we made a decision to purchase a home in Laconia because we found the perfect home for both of our families to share with our large family. And so I really think that this no parking needs to be reconsidered and at least make it a one way or on one side, I should say. Um, again, because how do you take a two-year-old or a three-year-old that you're potty training and you need to get back to your house quickly if there's no car or access for them to get back to the house? As well as, again, sick people that live in the home, um, there is someone in the home that has cancer. And if she needs to get back to the house because she is sick, how is that fair for her to not be able to be at our beach rights that we pay taxes for? Appreciate your input and certainly uh, uh, you, raise some, you raise some interesting issues. Thank you very much, Patty. It's nice to have you in the city of Laconia. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, Debbie and Chris Cost have their hand raised. Welcome Debbie and Chris for both of you, one of you. Can you hear me now, Mr. Mayor? I can hear you very well. Is this Chris Cost? Yes, it is, sir. Terrific, where are you calling from? I'm calling for, from 45 Woodvale Drive in Laconia, New Hampshire. I am part of the Wentworth Cove Estates uh, in regards to this uh, no parking uh, situation. Um, both my wife and I, have, we've lived in this neighborhood for 25 years and uh, we have occasionally, but not often, we've occasionally accessed our uh, lakefront um, access, our beach rights to uh, Lake Winnipesaukee. And for some reason, there was never seemed to be an issue in regards to the parking down there. Um, my wife and I, uh, we have four dogs. We take them down there. We take them down in our uh, vehicle. N never seemed to be an issue. All of a sudden now, within the last two, three years, this seems to be an issue. Um, I don't understand why. Um, our neighborhood area has, uh, has gone through a transformation with a lot of families, with a lot of children, lot, um, elderly people um, that have access to this uh, waterfront. Um, to you know, do this no parking really inhibits a lot of these people, um, especially uh, these mothers with children. They go down in their minivans uh, to have the children go on the beach and enjoy it for the day. Um, elderly residents that have to drive down there versus walking a mile. Um, I really think this is just a really, really inconvenience. And I would really hope that the city council will take into consideration of uh, revising this ordinance uh, to have parking on one side so that these people uh, along with ourselves can access the beach uh, when we want to. And uh, I'll leave it at that. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Cost, for your input this evening. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, for your uh, 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 thoughtfulness in hearing this. Mr. Mayor, at this time, no other hands are raised. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Moving right along to number 20, which is the city manager's report. Mr. Mayor? Yes. One hand just, one hand just went up. Ah, okay. Would that be Lynn? That would be. Didn't Lynn already speak? Mr. Um, Mayor, can you hear me? Oh, very well. Welcome. Mr. Mayor, um, I'm also, um, I should have identified myself. I'm also an attorney as well as a resident there in licensed in, Massa in Massachusetts. Um, I just wanted to um, add one more, a couple more comments. One, I think this problem has been exacerbated because of COVID because a lot of people were in their homes. So I think the beach was used with more frequency than had been in the past, which I don't think is going to be the case going forward when people return to work, kids are in school. Um, so I do think that maybe that was a, a pushing point. I think where the parking signs have been, all they're doing is pushing the problem down the road. I understand who uh, Attorney Nadeau represents. And basically what the council has done is put no parking signs in front of her clients' homes and essentially pushed it back to my house and further down. I don't have an issue with people parking on the road. I happen to be a resident. Um, I've never seen anyone leave a car overnight. I don't see the bumper to bumper traffic. I appreciate what Attorney Nadeau is saying about property values. As a homeowner there, I don't think I agree with her. I know I don't agree with her because I observe it. I'm there Thursday night through Monday mornings usually. And uh, I don't share her view that it is a bumper to bumper problem. And I think that we're just pushing this problem down the road by stopping it at 91. And if you go further down, you're gonna limit all of Woodvale. And I don't think in the interest of, of the public uh, access, it's not a fair decision. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much, Lynn. I appreciate your input. Mayor, at this time, no hands are raised. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. And moving right along to item number 20, which is the city manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So you have two reports in your agenda packet. Uh, I'm going to be about 30 seconds here, and I'll take any questions. But basically, we're in the area of Mechanic Street, starting with water. Uh, we'll be out in the area of Lakeport, Franklin Street area and stuff doing sewer um, soon after that. And those are the... Uh, the major road projects. We have a few minor road projects we're working. I know an area, uh, a section of Shore Drive was paid to, paved today. We also have an area on Wears Boulevard um, in the area from the Naswa um, down to the Roundabout, and also um, Franklin Street will be getting some work um, this spring construction season. Uh, on the economic development report, inflation number again, as I mentioned, with the budget starting to tick up a little bit, still in a very reasonable range. Uh, 2.6 was the month of March, so a third of the way through the year, we're averaging 1.9% inflation. And I'll take any questions on the reports or anything else councillors may have. Any questions or comments from councillors? Councillor Littman. Um, yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Mr. Manager, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the roster of streets to be addressed, when would that be uh, uh, fully public? Um, that's public now for what we're doing with existing dollars through this construction season and meaning through June 30th. Um, okay. And we're, we're, we're working on the list of potential now that I presented the budget and, and uh, Public Works Director Wes Anderson and Assistant Director Crystal Larson know the targeted dollar amount, they'll be firming up the list of projects above and beyond the big projects that we're doing for the work that'll happen post July 1st. So I would, I would expect in a couple of weeks, we would have something um, available that at least give us a, a sense of what's going to occur with available dollars. Good, thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Hamill. Yeah, thank you, <clears throat> Scott. I was just wondering when, uh, uh, or if you have a time frame, when they're going to fix the entrance and exits on Court Street Bridge, especially the exit uh, where the gas station is, that's pretty bad right there. Yeah, I believe when I spoke to Wes about that last week, uh, I know the, uh, the asphalt plants are open up full gear right now, and I think Wes is on board. I want to say he told me possibly as soon as Thursday, 
um, this week, weather permitting, and I don't know if we're um, still good with that, but it's, it's, it's sooner rather than later, much sooner rather than later. I can assure you that. Okay. Uh, they're going to address the sidewalks there too, or is that going to be at a later time? Um, we'll, we'll make sure that they're passable and, and cleaned up and, and good to go for the time frame. I don't know if there's significant work happening on the sidewalk, but that one, that one big um, dip that everybody uh, kind of swings around to avoid is definitely um, in the sooner rather than later category. Okay. Thank you, Scott. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Scott. And we'll move right along to new business. Under number 21 on your agenda. Under 21A is easement to construct a new drainage outlet from Franklin Street to Opeachy Street, um, public works. And in order to improve the drainage along Franklin Street from Washington Street to Fairmont Street needs a new drainage outlet to Lake Opeachy. Uh, new Hampshire Department of Environmental Services regulations require the city to install some form of water quality system to treat stormwater before it goes into a water body. Public Works has been in discussions with BDKS LLC the owner of 42 Franklin Street to obtain an easement for the new outlet to Lake Opeachy to include the stormwater treatment system. BDKS LLC has a group. If, if, if you'd like, I can probably explain it with the use of a map rather than you reading that entire paragraph for us. I would love that. <laughs> okay, so happy to do so. So if council would turn to page 40 of the agenda packet or it'd be the sixth page of that particular item and you'll see a map. And basically that's Franklin Street. Um, so the area we're highlighting says easement area that's uh, owned by 42 Franklin. Um, I think that's the address, but the, the reference that the, uh, the mayor just made for BDKS LLC, they're willing to grant us an easement there so we can properly collect the drainage uh, that comes off the streets through the stormwater system, treat it properly before it goes into the lake. And you'll see the area marked Paper Street. There's a little sliver there that was on a developer's lot years ago that the city never accepted, never constructed. We're not even, we, legal research says we don't even own it, although we probably have a right to access it type of thing. So um, very simple swap. Um, the owners who own everything um, in that big yellow highlighted area also own the property just to the right of where it says Paper Street. So for them to be able to make this a more contiguous parcel by the city giving up any rights to that Paper Street under a quit claim deed make a lot of sense. That also offers up some great potential going forward um, for a potential reuse of that site without having that little sliver out of it in the middle. So we think it's a win-win for potential um, better use of that site going forward by someone who already owns all the property around it. We get the easement we need to do the road project correctly. And um, we're not sure that we even own it anyway. Um, so that's what's basically before you. And that's why um, we're not going to a public hearing for selling property because it's not property that legal research believes we own. We just have a right to access it should we choose to. But staff strongly recommends this makes sense for the reasons that I've just outlined for you. Thank, uh, thanks very much. Uh, estimated cost to complete. The documentation is $2,000 paid for by the city's annual road maintenance program, correct? So I think right now, um, the recommendation uh, from Wes Anderson, and it sounds like you, Scott, is to approve the public works request to quit claim lot 366-82-5 in exchange for a drainage easement on the west end of BKS property at 42 Franklin Street. So uh, the first motion I'll be looking for here is a move to waive a reading of the quit claim deed in its entirety and to read by title only. So made by Councillor Cheney, seconded by Councillor Haynes. Any further discussion on this motion? Seeing none, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Councillor Cheney? Yes. Councillor Susie? Yes. Councillor Whitman? Yes. Councillor Haynes? Yes. Councillor Hamill? Yes. Councillor Felt? Yes. Exposing the affirmative, that motion passes. Second motion is a 
to move the city council to approve the quick claim deed for lot 366 slash 82 slash five and authorize the city manager to sign the deed. So made by Councillor Felch and seconded by Councillor Haynes. Any further discussion? Councillor Hamill, I see you're unmuted. Go right ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, Scott, um, way back when, probably 12 years ago, um, we did an asset uh, assessment of all our surplus property and uh, that one there was on the list and we actually tried to sell that piece of property um, along with others around the city that were you know, very small parcels that try and merge them with other uh, buildings in the area. So I'm not sure if there's a, um, any deed to that to the city, but I do remember uh, the city council looking into that piece of property along with others uh, in the area. I don't know if Henry remembers or not, but uh, I, I think that's the piece that uh, we looked at. So the 12 years would have been before my time, but I'm not doubting yes. that it's been on a list. Um, but again, I think sometimes, as you know, there are paper streets that show up in developments, but if they don't get constructed and formally accepted, that's all it is. And, and really the land would either revert back to the original developer or after a period of time, you know, to the center of the road for abutting property owners. And in this case, it's the same property owner and we never show it being accepted or the city having any right. And, and so we have researched that legally and our legal okay. counsel is confident that um, this is the process we should do. Okay, thank you, Scott. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilor Cheney? Yes. Councilor Susie? Yes. Councilor Littman? Yes. Councilor Haynes? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Councilor Felt? Yes. That's six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. Thank you. Moving along to item 21B, request to designate no parking on both sides of Clinton Street from Union Ave to Mechanic Street. If I'm not mistaken, we have a handy map here as well, which would be on page 42. Mr. Mayor? Oh. Yes, Councilor Susie. I, I'm, I'm not sure if this is the right time or not, but I'm going to be asking the council to table this matter at this time until uh, and have more discussion with the property owners because I've received information from both of them that want to have some more discussion with myself and Mr. Anderson. So if your motion is to table, it's non debatable. Is there a second? Yes, I'll second it. Seconded by Councillor Haynes. I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Further discussion? Oh, there's no discussion. I'm going to call the roll. Councillor Cheney? Yes. Councillor Susie? Yes. Councillor Littman? Yes. Councillor Haynes? Yes. Councillor Hamill? Yes. Councillor Felt? Yes. Six votes in the affirmative. That, mo that motion is passes and item 21B is tabled. Moving along to 21C, which is first reading of resolution 2021-06 relative to the issuance of a bond to reimburse the city for certain property purchases. In 2020, the city purchased property at 30 and 50 Church Street and associated parking areas from the Roman Catholic Bishop of Manchester for $1.13 million. The 30 Church Street property has since sold for $447,188.29. As per prior council votes, it is anticipated that the 50 Church Street property will be sold as well. The city intends to retain ownership of the parking areas as a long-term asset. It is proposed that a bond with a term of 10 years be issued covering the remaining balance of approximately $683,000 to distribute the fiscal impact of the purchase. The exact fiscal impact is conditional on interest rates at the date of issuance, given recent experience, an interest rate of approximately 2% is anticipated. With this assumption, the project projected interest costs associated with this bond over the 10-year proposed term is $75,000. 
city manager recommends approving the attached resolution authorizing a bond in the amount of six hundred eighty-three dollars, a thousand dollars. Excuse me. Um, proposed motions. We have three of them. The first is to waive the reading of this resolution in its entirety and to read by title only. So made by Councillor Cheney, seconded by Councillor Haynes. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I've asked the clerk to call the roll. Councillor Cheney. Yes. Councillor Susie. Yes. Councillor Whitman. Yes. Councillor Haynes. Yes. Councillor Hamill. Yes. Councillor. <coughs> yes. That's six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. We're looking for a second motion here to move a first reading of resolution 2021 06 relative to authorizing bonds and notes for, of the city for property acquisition in the amount of $683,000. So made by Councillor Phelps, seconded by Councillor Cheney. Any further discussion? See, seeing none, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Councillor Cheney? Yes. Councillor Susie? Yes. Councillor Littman? Yes. Councillor Haynes? Yes. Councillor Hamill? Yes. Councillor Susie? Yes. Six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. Third and final motion. So, uh, as a motion to schedule a public hearing on May 10th, 2021, during the regular city council meeting regarding resolution 2021 06 relative to authorizing bonds and notes of the city for property acquisition in the amount of $683,000. Motion made by Councillor Felch, seconded by Councillor Susie. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Councillor Cheney. Yes. Councillor Susie. Yes. Councillor Lippman. Yes. Councillor Haynes. Yes. Councillor Hamill. Yes. Councillor Felt. Yes. That's six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. Moving on to 21D. This is a discussion pertaining to the Colonial Theater stage repairs at the April 12th, 2021 council meeting. Councillor Hamill mentioned that the stage at the Colonial Theater is in need of repair. It was found the stage is slightly uneven and will need to be repaired before any performances can take place. Uh, right now, I'll be looking for uh, a motion to authorize the city manager to identify available fun funds not to exceed $50,000 and bring a transfer request back to the city council for approval. Motion by Councillor Hamill, seconded by Councillor Susie. Uh, uh, further discussion on this matter. I guess but my Mr. question, Mr. right, go right. Ahead. Oh, sorry. Who was speaking up? I did. Go right ahead. Mr. Mayor, can I ask Councillor Hamill if that is the amount that is needed or is there additional things that we need to look at? Oh, well, that is the amount for the repair of the stage. It should be under the 50, but uh, there are other items on the Canal Street side uh, that we'd be looking to purchase, uh, such as furniture and blinds, uh, but I have not uh, received an estimate on that. So. Okay, all right. Uh, is that something you would desire to do? Absolutely. To get a Mr. Mayor, I think, you know, given this situation is, uh, you know, let's finish it. I, I have viewed the stage. It does need repair. Um, and I think that there was a couple of other things that were mentioned that uh, if we could get a price on it, I, I'd like to see the, the entire project finished. So, Councillor Haynes, are you suggesting an amendment? Um, to increase the dollar amount that the city manager should look to identify? 50K more. Yes, do we make it 100,000? So, uh, Councilor Haynes offers a friendly amendment um, to this. Uh, so, um, it, th does, does the amendment have a second? Seconded by Councilor Cheney. Is there any discussion on the amendment which would now, the motion would now read, it's a move to authorize the city manager to identify available funds not to exceed $100,000 
and bring a transfer request back to the council for approval. Uh, I'll, I'll defer to the city manager at this point. Uh, I certainly will defer to the wish of the council. I would prefer to leave this into two separate categories. This one is kind of an emergency fix that we want to get done now so we can open the Colonial. And I'm really trying to identify funds that will remain within this fiscal year budget that maybe we haven't expended due to certain COVID programs or maybe you know, the winter wasn't as bad and we've got some winter funds that we can find with dollars before they're going to lapse into fund balance at the end of this year. The other are for new purchases that I agree that are needed, but I think we're identifying, you know, those costs and those particular, you know, needs versus the wants. What do we need to buy right now to make the theater functional? And are there some nice to haves that we want to add in later on? Um, I think some of those funds could come from non-capital reserve or, or other areas um, outside of the budget. So um, that's why we, you know, I'm, I'm not saying those things are needed, Councilor Haynes, absolutely. But I think this is trying to scrounge together some dollars this budget year before they expend. Um, we've got a pretty good handle on things because we're basically through the end of April. So we're 10 months through the year and, and um, that would be my druthers. And I'll identify existing dollars and then we can work towards the other list once it's fine tuned. But um, that's just my request. Councilor Haynes. Mr. Mayor, is it possible to withdraw that amendment at this time? I believe that it is. Okay, I so wish. All right, so that amendment is withdrawn. Um, okay, I think, we can, I think we can just proceed with the, uh, uh, the original amendment here then. So is there any further discussion in regards to the original motion on the floor? Seeing none, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Councillor Cheney. Yes. Councillor Susie. Yes. Councillor Lippman. Yes. Councillor Haynes. Yes. Councillor Hamill. Yes. Councillor Felt. Yes. So that is six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. Number 21E, which is a request to change the designated no parking area on Wentworth Cove. Um, Scott, I'm not sure. Would you like to give us a, a view from 10,000 feet on this uh, to get us started and we'll see where it leads? I'd be happy to. So there's a there's a number of moving parts here. Um, first and foremost, I know Councillor Feltz was, was approached a number of weeks back or months ago now with some concerns that attorney uh, Nato had uh, uh, referenced tonight representing some specific property owners who were concerned about a lot of parking in both sides and encroaching and possible public safety issues and um, folks who maybe shouldn't have the rights to be using the beach, using the beach and who's enforcing it. So um, Councillor Felch brought that forward and, and the no parking came in. Subsequent to that, there were uh, it was determined there were a lot more neighbors than just the ones represented by attorney NATO and uh, folks who, as again, you heard tonight, live a distance away who really need an opportunity to get down there and, and park, um, you know, not as a luxury, just more or less as a necessity in certain cases to be able to utilize uh, that beach area, which they have deeded rights to. And I forget the exact number, but I think it's somewhere between 40 and 50 properties have deeded beach rights in there. Um, Attorney Nadu did uncover something through research today and sent me something from our city ordinances going back to the 70s that did say that both sides of Wentworth Cove on that stretch were no parking. Um, and it very well may have worked fine for 50 years or longer. Um, the interesting thing was it was never signed in all those years. There were never any, any signs there. Um, so I don't know what has changed on um, the use in the neighborhood over the years, but um, you know whether it's COVID or whether it's just a changeover of, of property owners and people wanting to access the water, um, you know, we, 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 we see that. So certainly to make that no parking on both sides is to the benefit of some immediate abutters, but certainly not a number of people who want to be able to access and come down with blankets or coolers or swim toys or whatever else might be there. Um, so, you know, it's not going to please everybody, but I think a happy medium is what Councillor Felch has requested here to um, 
to make some parking available for those folks with regard to people from Wolfboro or Alton coming in and using what is a private beach. That's really an association matter to be addressing. That's not a city matter to be policing who comes in onto that beach area. I, I would assume there must be some kind of a homeowners or a beach association for insurance or maintenance or some other small things or just the liability under it. I could be wrong, but as an association, they could certainly look to, you know, issue those rubber wristbands that you got to have a wristband to come onto the association beach and you only get it if you're one of the 40 whatever properties who are allowed to do that. But I think there's solutions that they can do to help police something that should be a valued asset to the neighborhood and everybody should be looking to have it only used by those who are legally entitled to do it. Um, so I think we need to separate that issue out from the, the purely parking and accessibility. And um, again, I understand that things might have changed over years and this would never was an issue before, um, but I believe you know, from common sense would say there needs to be some reasonable access for folks to park and be able to reasonably use something that they have deeded beach rights to. Thank you, Scott. And so, I, certainly defer, I certainly defer to Councillor Felch as well to, to chime in on his thoughts to it because he is the councillor who's kind of been in the weeds on this a little bit. So let's, let's move this to the discussion phase and then we can do that if that's okay. So right now I'll be looking for a motion to move the city council void all existing designated no parking areas on Wentworth Cove Road and designate the east side which is the odd numbered side of the road, a no parking area from the northern edge of the Summit Ave right of way to the southern edge of Woodvale Road right of way. So made by Councillor Felch. Is there a second? Seconded by Councillor Cheney. Uh, further discussion on this mo motion. I'd look to you, Councillor Felch, to start things off. Yeah, I, I'd just say there, there are 44 owners of that beach rights. They all pay taxes on them. Um, they definitely need a place to park, uh, especially somebody that's got children or handicapped, etc. Also, if you make no parking on both sides, then your landscapers and people working on the properties don't have a place to park. Um, so this was a happy medium, hopefully making the uh, waterfront properties happier because they won't be parking in front of their houses and uh, have a place for them to park on the opposite side of the road. Well, isn't this, so there's, there would be no parking along the edge of the property that sits on the waterfront, correct? Correct. Okay. And uh, uh, Councillor Hamill. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, we made a decision last time and now we're relooking at this. Um, my, my concern is, if you have no parking on all the homes on the lakeside side of the property, you're shifting the uh, parking to the other side. So that means that the lakeside will have places for their guests and visitors and that there, but the other side may not. Um, I don't know. I just have a problem with this. I, I, I just don't want to see this coming back uh, in another three weeks. Have we notified all the property owners on that whole area? Let me add to that. Sure. Um, also, one other issue, if we have parking on both sides of that road, it would be an emergency vehicle hazard to be able to get emergency vehicles down that road. So that, that's one of the other reasons to have no parking on one side. Now, if you remember right, he did say that the original was no parking on both sides. So... Mm. We're kind of but my question is, have we sent a letter to all these residents? Because we're, we're hearing tonight that a lot of them don't, didn't hear, hear nothing about this. Well, I had a meeting with some of the owners, 15 to 20 of them there. Um, they've been communicating back and forth. Um, and the problem we had the first time was Attorney Nadeau made comment that people were notified. Well, apparently it was only her clients that were notified and not the actual property owners of the uh, beach rights. Well, if they have an association, then has the city sent a letter to the association they for don't them have to? An association. Huh? There's, 
there's no official association. They're all actually owners of the property. This, this, this wasn't something that the city was driving, Councillor Hamill, so it wasn't on us. It was a count, ward councillor got a request and then once something changed, other folks came in and said, hey, you know, we need an opportunity and, and we didn't know this was happening, but it wasn't something that the city was initiating originally. Okay. I can understand it could be a problem there uh, with, with the uh, parking and all that. And like Tony said, uh, you do no uh, parking on both sides of emergency vehicles. But I have a problem if they all of them haven't been notified. Well, weren't they notified? Wasn't both sides? Was it just not enforced that both sides were not no parking? Isn't that the, the the research that Attorney Nato uncovered? It was actually never posted no parking, but it was always a no parking both sides of the street. Is that correct, Scott? Yeah, going back to what she said today, which, you know, is accurate, it's going back to the 70s, it was there. Somewhere in our city ordinances, a lot of the no parking regulations fell off of the city books, and we're in the process of reconstructing some of those things. So that's why it wasn't in current documentation. But going back to 1975 um, document that she sent me today, it was listed as no parking on both sides for, again, coming up on almost 50 years now. With, with no signs, no signage ever. And I guess no problems up until recently. And that just could be because there's a turnover in the neighborhood and more people are taking the opportunity to enjoy what it is that they have the rights to. So one question I have, if, if looking at the, the, the map layout, residents are looking to access parcel number 16. Mm -hmm. Right. Yet we want to prevent parking on that side of the road which means that you could park all the way up the street, we'll say from Wentworth Cove to Woodvale Drive, you'd still have to cross Wentworth Cove Road to access the parcel. So I guess my question is, wouldn't it be safer if you had no parking on the other side of the road? So people could walk along the, beat, the, the shore side of the road not have to cross the Wentworth Cove in order to access parcel 16. So can I address that? Sure. So actually they would be walking down the other side of the road because all the cars would be parked on the opposite side. Um, plus, as you heard, most of the complainants from before are waterfront property owners that don't own any part of that beach rights. So we're moving them away from their properties. Trying to appease both sides. Yeah, but then they've got their back to oncoming traffic as opposed to walking towards oncoming traffic. Well, it depends on which direction they're coming from. Some of them have- I just assume people walking, parking, walking towards the beach, but I guess you're right. I don't guess you're right, you're right. Yeah, and they'd walk on the beach side versus walking where the cars are. Okay. Oh, sorry. Councilor Susie, go right ahead. Tony, just one clarification. So you're telling me that the people who have the beach rights because they have the property on the water don't want the cars parking on their side. Is that right? No, the people on the water side have their own beaches. They don't right. have beach rights. But they don't like the cars parking. They don't like the cars parked in front of their houses. That's what it comes right down to. Because if you remember before, they were talking about parking on their lawns, et cetera, et cetera. Right, but it's okay for the cars to park on the other side of the street, according to them. I'm, I'm sure there might be some people over there that don't want it, but most of them have the beach rights. Okay. So, Tony, one more time, this solves what problem? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> it, it solves the problem of the fact that we had no <laughs> sides and we have people that own beachfront beach property and they'll have a place to park. 
Did I see another hand up there uh, from councilors? Councilor Lippman. I guess I would say that going back to what Councilor Hamill's comment is before we vote on this, we may be better off um, letting it, making sure that the communication has occurred. I think, you know, just having been on the council for a number of years that when these situations come up, you know, you think everybody's aware of it and then you find out later that they're not. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't disagree with that. Council felt just come up with the reasonable solution is to make sure we, we don't necessarily understand all the nuances because we don't live there. So maybe just leave it on the table for one more meeting to make sure that everybody's aware of this issue. I think that's a wise idea, Council Littman, uh, having been through a similar situation just at the airport recently where we made a decision to the runway approaches. And then when we when the public was notified, they were unhappy with that new approach. We had a big hearing and then we had to flip it back to the original way. Um, um, I, I, I think slowing down, pumping the brakes a little bit might be prudent here. Um, making sure everyone is notified, make sure we are in fact solving a problem that's not creating another problem or just that's gonna be back before us in, in a couple of months. Well, I can say I've talked to at least half of the people that own the beach rights and I know they have been talking to everybody. They've gotten an email link together. They're talking amongst themselves. So that's, there's probably 44 people right there that know. Um, I mean, it's up to you. If you want a table, how are we going to notify them? Well, we could put a notice in the paper. I mean, you only heard from people tonight that want it this way. Yeah, and I don't, I don't doubt that they want it this way. It's, um, I think we have to be satisfied that we've completed our due diligence to put everybody on notice that has an interest in this before we make a decision and find ourselves revisiting it in a couple of weeks. Certainly, if we were to make a decision come May, um, no doubt the signage would be put up shortly thereafter. It's still, you know, we're, we're abutting the summer season. Um, you know, I think we can still do it and, and accommodate those that want parking. All right, let's table it. And uh... so is there a motion to table? I'll make that motion. Uh, is there a second? Seconded by Councilor Hamill. Uh, motions to table are non-debatable. I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Councillor Cheney? No. I'm sorry, did you, did you say yes or no? No. No, okay, thank you. Councillor Susie? Yes. Councillor Littman? Yes. Councillor Haynes? Yes. Councillor Hamill? Yes. Councillor Felch? No. Four votes in the affirmative that uh, item number 21E is tabled. Moving hey, along to, yeah, oh yes, Councilor Hamill. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask that the city uh, sends a letter out to these addresses and uh, notify them uh, of what is being discussed uh, so that uh, everybody knows. Put it on the agenda for next meeting. Put it on the agenda. I'd also would it would it be appropriate to put a mess uh, a notice in uh, the Laconia Daily Sun as well, City Manager? Yeah, I mean, we're happy to do some kind of a letter. Uh, I think some of these folks are weekend people or, or seasonal to some extent, and maybe not around. Uh, I probably I think there's probably some folks who are still on this Zoom call, and if somebody maybe could email my office with a list. I mean, someone has got to know who's got deeded beach rights. I'm not sure the city has a list of who the the specific property owners are in that neighborhood. So if somebody in on this call who is part of this association could send some details my way to help us facilitate a proper mailing list, that probably would be the quickest way to do it. Or Councillor Felch, if you could help facilitate that. Yeah, I'm, Sandra is on right now. If you wanted to talk to her, I think she can... Uh take care of that, which she 
has been doing. Uh, so, so maybe you can connect with Sandra and then I will do that. Me a list, and I think a direct mailing to everybody that goes out this week would be the easiest and cleanest way to do it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamill. You're welcome. Thank you. Moving along to 21F right now, which is the city employees covered by the wage and compensation plan. Uh, this was submitted by the city manager. Would you like to take this one as well? I will. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So as I mentioned during my budget presentation, we have four collective bargaining units and two of them are under um, very basic one year agreements because of the COVID times and unknown finances and a number of things. Um, we went with a one year uh, contract as opposed to the more standard three year contracts we have typically done. The only change in those contracts, other than some wordsmithing, was into the cost of living adjustment. So this is a proposed change to the wage and compensation plan for city employees who are not covered by a collective bargaining agreement. And it mirrors that effective July 5th, 2021, those employees would have a 1.8% cost of living adjusted to the wage and comp plan for their particular position. Um, so that's my recommendation to you. You do not have to act on this tonight if you do not want to, although it's a very simple um, one-liner, if you will. So I certainly would encourage you, if you're ready to, to take action on it tonight. You do have up to 30 days. If you don't act upon this within 30 days, um, then it would go into effect by default, so to speak. So um, not a requirement for tonight, but certainly uh, it does mirror what you've approved for other groups. And I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions of the city manager before we consider a motion? Seeing none, uh, the proposed motion is a, is to approve the wage and compensation plan as presented. So made by Councillor Hamill, seconded by Councillor Haynes. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilor Cheney? Yes. Councilor Lucy? Yes. Councilor Littman? Yes. Councilor Haynes? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Councilor Phelps? Yes. But six votes in the affirmative, that motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Councilors. Item 21G, which is a request to appoint Leonard Miner as Ward 2 moderator for a term expiring at the end of November 2021. The current Ward 2 moderator submitted his resignation on February 19th, 2021. Uh, we're looking for a motion right now to appoint Leonard Miner as Ward 2 moderator for a term expiring at the end of November 2021. So made by Councillor Susi and seconded by Councillor Felch. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Councillor Cheney? Yes. Councillor Susi? Yes. Councillor Littman? Yes. Councillor Haynes? Yes. Councillor Hamill? Yes. Councillor Felch? Yes. Six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. Thank you, Councillors. Thank you. Moving right along to number 22 on your agenda. Second reading of the resolution 2021-05 relative to a proposed land swap and boundary line adjustment, adjustment between Antaeus Holdings Limited and the city of Laconia. So uh, um, I think we perhaps remember this from last meeting in which we, uh, which this uh, matter was discussed. So this is a proposal for a boundary line adjustment and minor land swap for parcels of equivalent size totaling less than 600 square feet. A property is located in the area of Railroad Avenue, which runs between um, 
Blizzard's showroom and Scott Everett's new development. If approved, the proposal will neaten up the boundary line in terms of laying out the sidewalk and provide parking for the new development to allow it to be all on city owned land. Legal counsel has advised the city council follow the process outlined in chapters 183-7, 183-8 of the city's code to declare a portion of the city's property as surplus property. Please note that a two thirds vote of the council is required for any vote relative to this matter. This report was submitted by Scott Myers, a city manager. Be looking to, for three motions here. One is a, mo a motion to waive a reading of resolution 2021 Dash 05 in its entirety and to read by title only. So made by Councilor Cheney, seconded by Councilor Haynes. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilor Cheney? Yes. Councilor Susie? Yes. Councilor Littman? Yes. Councilor Haynes? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Councilor Felch? Yes. Six votes in the uh, affirmative. That motion passes. We're looking for a second motion to move a second reading of resolution 2021-05 relative to the proposed boundary line adjust, adjustment and land swap between Anteus Holdings Limited and the city of Laconia. So made by Councillor Felch, seconded by Councillor Hamill. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Councillor Cheney? Yes. Councillor Susie? Yes. Councillor Littman? Yes. Councillor Haynes? Yes. Councillor Hamill? Yes. Councillor Felch? Yes. Six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. And finally, are we looking for a motion to move to approve a resolution 2021 05 relative to the proposed boundary line adjustment and land swap between Ateus Holdings Limited and the city of Laconia and declaration of a portion of the city's property map, property at tax map 367 189 24 as surplus so made by Councilor Felt seconded by Councilor Hamill any further discussion on the motion hmm. seeing none I'd ask the clerk to call the roll Councilor Cheney yes Councilor Cece yes Councilor Littman yes Councilor Haynes yes Councilor Hamill yes Councilor Felt yes that's six votes in the affirmative and that motion passes. Under now item, agenda item 22B, which is discussion and guidance on a temporary traffic order for the Motorcycle Week event to be held June 12th, 2021, through June 20th, 2021. City staff is requesting guidance from the council pertaining to a temporary traffic order for Motorcycle Week, which would potentially include centerline parking. In 2020, Motorcycle Week happened in name only, and the council did not approve any temporary traffic orders for the event. Um, Scott, I ask you just to briefly go over this, if you would, just a little historical historic context. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So we did attach, just as a template, the 2019 temporary traffic order, uh, which called for one-way traffic, motorcycles only, centerline parking, um, it did identify a, a, a small no parking area down towards the end of the boardwalk, kind of in the area of Tower Street to New Hampshire Ave in the early morning hours. And I believe that's where the, um, the, the rally uh, stages some of the rides and the rides are typically out of there by 10, 1030 in the morning. So that is accounted for. Um, this traffic order also um, shows the closure of Tower Street for a portion of a certain day for the motorcycle hill climb. Uh, I believe I heard that the application for the street climb, the hill climb just came into city offices this afternoon. So we'll certainly confirm that up or confirm that and make sure that that's um, yeah, what the date is that's occurring. So all these dates obviously would be adjusted for 2021 um, under number 14. We'd also want to ensure that the numbered parking spaces um, for progressive and um, and or AARP are the correct ones and or being utilized um, because we don't have confirmation um, as of yet. But from city staff perspective, we have no objections to um, having the standard uh, motorcycle week traffic flow down there and having these uh, temporary changes instituted. I did reach out to Jim Morash, um, owner of the Mount Washington, uh, just because there's usually some 
dates that he might have charter buses coming in or school trips. And because of where we are with COVID this year, he is not aware of anything that is on his books that is going to need buses getting down or any kind of special assistance. At this point, I let him know that if something were to change and you were to book something, just, you know, let us know. They're, those are usually early or, or mid morning, you know, departures type of thing. So we can certainly work with them to get a bus down. But at this point um, he was all set and had no uh, concerns. And that's usually the one property owner that, um, you know, will raise a question or two or just give us a date or two. And this year he, he seems to be all set. So, um, you know, this is the template. Staff and I are ready to, to plug in the appropriate things and work with the association to make sure we've identified um, the proper dates and, and locations and everything. Uh, th thank you, thank you, Scott, for the um, overview of this. Uh, by all, uh, for, for all intents and purposes, on uh, 2019, during the 2019 event, this uh, traffic pattern, traffic plan, if you will, worked well, correct? Yes, this is the one that uh, has been in place for several years. I think the only change that we've gotten away from is there's a, a, a slight difference to how the traffic used to run from Friday night through like Sunday morning or Monday morning, and then public works crews had to get down there and, and change something. I, I a little blurry on some of the details. Councilor Hamill may know better, but I think at least for the past couple of years where we've had it, we've made this one traffic order go into effect um, the entire event, and it seems to have worked well. All right. So this would, this would allow, I mean, uh, direction, if we were to give you some direction based on this document here, it would begin to prepare to proceed in the same fashion as we did in 2019. Um, and it would be able to accommodate if and when we took any restraints off the number of vendors that we might be um, issuing permits to along the boardwalk. Yes, this would have no impact on the number of vendors. I mean, the vendors, um, as we stand right now, as of this moment, you know, would be spaced a little more, but this is really dealing with um, parking vehicles on the streets, the direction of traffic flow, the limitations of this being motorcycles only, uh, the couple of spaces for progressive and potentially AARP identifying the ability from the association's uh, point of view to put out cones and blocks and spaces in the early morning on the days they have rides leaving from um, Lakeside Avenue. And this would accommodate the Tower Hills uh, Street, you know, the, the hill climb as well on, on Tower Street. Um, so we would work with them to make sure we've captured everything, plug in the proper dates to make it uh, valid for 2021. And if it's your consensus, we would do that. And we would have that on the agenda um, for May 10th for a formal vote. But at least you would be sending a strong message tonight that it's your intent, if it is, to have a normal motorcycle week traffic pattern down on Lakeside Avenue. Okay, great. Um, Councilor Felch. Yes. Um, it appears that hotels and cottages are booked solid for the week. So we're gonna have a lot of people here. So if we're trying to make things safe for Motorcycle Week, we need to make sure we have as many outdoor activities as possible. Even doctors agree that it's safer to be outside. So as for vendors, um, if we have so many people and we cut our vendors in half, then we're multiplying the number of people that are gonna be in those vendors by two. Councilor Felch, with all due respect, what's this got to do with a parking plan? This, I talked to Manager Myers earlier in the week. This was supposed to be on the agenda this week. He told me I could bring it up during this section. So I will, thank you. So if we're, if we're putting our vendors in half, we're creating more people in each vendor. Um, as of May 7th, executive order number 52 will expire, which mandates for restaurants and bars. We'll open up, open them up 100%. And without beer tents, that forces everyone inside being crowded together instead of outside where it is safer. With motorcycle week seven weeks away, most everyone that wants to be vaccinated should be. We have heard from over 100 people with 95% of them in favor of Motorcycle Week 
with no restrictions. So since I represent the people, I would like to make a motion to have 100% vendors, beer tents, centerline parking, one-way traffic, and everything the same as it was for 2019 for Motorcycle Week from June 12th to the 20th. Councilor Hamill. Well, there's a motion on the floor, so. Well, it hasn't, hasn't been seconded, so I'd be looking for a second. Councilor Cheney is offering the second. Is there any further discussion? Councilor Hamill. Uh, I'm totally in favor of the temporary traffic order for 2019, but uh, I'm not in favor of 100% uh, fenders. Councilor Susi. Totally in favor of all the traffic situations at the same time since the state is going to be opening up restaurants and everything else hundred percent, the governor has taken away the, the mask requirements and the people that attend this, this rally motorcycle week, we're all adults, uh, common sense. Uh, I'm open it up is the way I would go. Councilor Lippman. So I can support the uh, traffic patent. Um, I do think that we did hear from people who had concerns. While they may not have been the majority of people that reached out, there's, I don't know of an event that's large scale, whether it be uh, going to the Red Sox or, or going to the Bruins or other things where they just say no holds bar, just go for it. Particularly with, you know, we've just had to have um, our public schools um, put kids in quarantine uh, due to 10 cases in the schools. It's not about whether you go to the event or not, or whether you're vaccinated or not. It's about um, the level of risk that you bring into the community. And there's an acceptable level of risk. And I think certainly the, um, you know, the governor um, did not say don't um, um, consider um, public health measures. In fact, he encouraged that. Um, and, you know, I think that we should community and our success as a community is about, about give and take. And for us to just go all one way based on one segment of the community, a very important segment of the community without consideration for those who can't protect themselves. It's not just about people coming to the event and leaving the event. It circulates in the community. And I think, you know, in as much as you can cite statistics or not cite statistics, the reality is you just have to look around the country and around the world that this thing is not over for us. It's certainly, um, there's an increased level of risk that we can take, which is I think opening up the event to the level that's already been proposed, opening up the center parking. There may be some other things we can do, um, but I think just um, basically going full board with no consideration whatsoever for the rest of the community that may not participate in the event, but would be affected by what gets left behind. I think that's wrong. Thank you, Councillor Lippman. Mm -hmm. Councillor Felch. Yes, um, let's not forget that this is an outside event. We're gonna have people here. People aren't not gonna be here just because we have half the number of vendors or because we don't have beer tents. We're giving them stuff to do to separate from each other. Plus Meredith is completely opening up. They're going 100%. You've got fairs and craft fairs and everything that's going 100%, your restaurants, your bars, everything. There's no reason why we shouldn't open things up for this event. Well, I think we've heard, um, if I couldn't, Mr. Mayor, I think we oh, have- yeah, please do. I think we have heard from a segment of the community that doesn't want it to be full bear. And I think there's you know, public health reasons why full bear, no, no, no restraints whatsoever is, you know, people have a liberty to participate in what they want to. They can go for a ride, they can go for a meal, they can do what they want. But you know, when you start to congregate people um, with drinking in a, in a tent and other spots, just encouraging it more than we need to. They can have a very good time um, here without going uh, no holes bar. And I think 
that's a part of the community that's not comfortable with that. And I think they should have some, you know, we're going 95% the way what people want it. Why do we have to just ignore those who are concerned about um, their, their personal health in the community? I just don't understand why we can't have some modem of consideration for those who um, are concerned about their risks. Councilor Felch. Yeah, I must say I was elected to represent the people and the right. people to me, it would be 95% of the people, not the 5%. Um, I'm representing the 95% of the people I've heard from. Yeah, and I think as a community, um, you know, consideration for those people who can't protect themselves, you know, I think that's, that's not fair to them. And I think it's supposed to not just represent those who contact us, but the entire community. Um, the city manager, can you, um, you have pretty good data at your fingertips. Can you give us some update on um, what's going on in the state as far as vaccinations? Um, Ken, give me one second, Mr. Mayor. So I'm on the state of New Hampshire um, website under the COVID-19 page, under the news tab from Department of Health and Human Services, which puts out a, um, a daily update on everything from cases to um, vaccines to by county, by community, whatever. So the most recent date, I was hoping there would be one out today because the last one that came out, um, and I'm guessing it'll be due tomorrow that I find particularly useful, is the COVID-19 vaccine allocation update. And this is from April 20th. So it's, it's six days old. Probably the next updated report will be due out tomorrow. What I find most interesting with this report is um, they break down the age groups um, by typically, you know, 10 year chunks. And I know I've heard Councillor you know, Fellows say in the past, well, we can't count, you know, kids in our population of our 1.3 million because they don't come to motorcycle week. Um, I think the flip could be said for the older population. So of our 75 plus population, and again, this is from Department of Health and Human Services as of April 20th, 50.7% of 75 and older have had um, both doses. So half of the 75 plus, it goes up to 61% for the 65 to 74 group. So if you say the 65 and older are typically not our target market for folks coming to Motorcycle Week, with a few exceptions, I think most of us would agree that our group is running from, here it says age 16, because that's the age you can get, but let's call it from age 18 to 65 is probably our target market for people who come to Motorcycle Week. So in the groups, and they listed here as 16 to 29, because again, that's the age you can get it. 16 to 29, we have 7.1% of the population has received both doses. 30, 30 to 39, it's 13.6% of the population, both doses. 40 to 49, 16.1%. And then 50 to 64 is 21.5%. They also list of those same groups, how many have one doses. And I think this is important because if you look at this data and say, okay, within four weeks from now, because that's how they're scheduling the appointments, whether it was Moderna or Pfizer, you're on a four week schedule, we can look at the one dose percentages and that would tell us very approximately how many people would have had both doses. So again, the 16 to 29 age group, we have 22% of the population has one dose in. So we can extrapolate that a month from now, that's gonna be the amount that has two. The 30 to 39 year olds at 34%, the 40 to 49 year olds at 44% and 50 to 64 year olds at 57%. Um, so that's, that's the state's data of where we are with one and two doses. And again, the guidance was 14 days after your second dose is when you're um, believed to have as full a protection as you're going to get from, from the vaccine. And we know that they're, they're running 95%-ish effective, which is a very great number. Nothing's 100% foolproof. So um, I wish we had 
the report that's coming out tomorrow available today. Uh, but we do know the J and J vaccine has been paused for a week. And we do know that countrywide, the rate has actually slowed this past week of the amount of shots being given from about 3 million a day to about 2.8 million a day. And again, that's across the country. New Hampshire has done a great job of getting the vaccine that it's allocated out in, and into communities and into people's arms. Um, and that I can say with firsthand knowledge. So um, happy to stop there and turn it back to you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks. Um, thanks, Scott. Um, Mr. Mayor, can I make one more point? Before Just certainly, start? certainly, yeah. You know, a typical motorcycle week without um, the COVID, you know, asking people to put up with some extra traffic, asking people to pick up with some extra noise, asking people who you know, don't participate in the event to, to be inconvenienced to somewhat to allow the rest of the community to benefit, which is very important to the overall economy, have no problem asking that. But we're really asking people here to, um, who have health concerns to, to, to be totally not considered. And I do think that we have some responsibility above all else is safety um, and, um, we can't guarantee safety, right? There's no, all we can do is minimize risk a bit here um, based on what the guidelines are or not going to be. And I just say, please have some respect for, for those people who don't want to take the, as much risk as, you know, all, all in, no, no constraints whatsoever. You know, I, I understand people want to exercise their personal liberty, which they should be entitled to do, but not at the expense of someone else's health. And it's not just about just stay away. It really isn't. That's not how the disease works. Thank you, Council Let me Go right ahead, Council Crouch. Just one quick thing. If, if you have concerns or you have health issues, wouldn't you have already gotten the shot? So what about children um, that are under 16 years of age? You know, we're talking about some of the kids at risk and where you're starting to see things around the country is in the, the under 18 year old group, you know, have some consideration for the schools, if nothing else. Actually, I believe schools will be out by motorcycle week. No. Well, it's gonna be, it's gonna be close, uh, certainly. You know, I, I personally feel right along, even going back to last year, this is really a data-driven decision in so many respects. Um, there are a number of variables that um, um, it'd be nice if we had um, more solid numbers, more number, numbers that were more convincing that we would be resilient or more resilient um, to what's going on with the, uh, with the pandemic. Um, uh, as I've said right along, uh, I feel my primary responsibility or our primary responsibility should be public health. Um, you can't have a, a good economy if you don't have a healthy um, uh, population. Um, I think one, that's 1A. 1B is certainly our local economy and local businesses that depend on a strong season. So it's always going to be a, be a bit of a balancing um, um, endeavor here to, to try and figure out what we should, what we should do. Um, I'm looking at these numbers. I'm no expert in public health, but even if we were to double many of these uh, vaccination rates, <clears throat> um, it still seems to be in my mind, it's not high enough. I'd like to see a higher vaccination rate to lower, to, to mitigate risk even more. Um, I think we should be aware of certainly what's gone on in some of the states around the country. Uh, reading up on Michigan right now uh, is very disconcerting and some of the evidence that's coming out of there. Um, what, I, what I would like to do right now is for us to perhaps consider calling a 
a special uh, meeting if possible sometime within the next seven to 10 days solely to discuss this. Hold on, Tony. Yeah, can I, can I no. just... No, 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 let me no, 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 no. This is going to save I'm, a lot of time. This is going to save I'm, time. I, look, just Tony, let, no. Just let me say what I'm going to say. Oh, Tony, I no. want to amend my motion. We all seem to be in agreement with the parking in the one way. I'll amend my motion to remove the vendors and beer tents and have everything parking and one-way traffic as, as 2019. There's already been a, vote, a motion made and second, so it's something we have to vote on. So let me amend my motion and vote on the parking. Tony, uh, 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 Tony you, can, you can do that, uh, no problem. But uh, you were insistent on bringing this issue up and demanding you bring it up. We gave you that, I gave you that opportunity to certainly address it and it certainly mm -hmm. did so. So, um, you know, I, I'm, my concern is I'm not convinced that this is the uh, appropriate time to say we move back to 100% right now. And okay. I'm just not convinced the, the data the data is not supporting it as far as I'm concerned. So let me Tony, my Tony, 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 relax. So what I'm going to do is suggest that we have uh, a, a call a special meeting a week to 10 days from now to once again, solely take a look at this issue on the agenda and to analyze the data and see if that's the appropriate time to move it from a 50% up to something higher and to consider whether um, beer tents at some capacity make sense. Right now, I don't think the numbers support that. They don't convince me. I realize there's a motion on the table, um, but I think that's where I stand. And I think that that would be a prudent way to take a look at data. And we're all dying to blow the economy open and, and get back to some degree of normalcy. But I agree with uh, Councillor Littman that public health, uh, the people who are left behind here, the people who are uh, still the most vulnerable people in our, in our community, we should be concerned about. Okay. I would like to amend my motion to be- You're gonna withdraw the motion or are you gonna amend it? I'm gonna amend it. Go right ahead. I'd like to amend it to remove vendors and beer tents from the motion and be just about center line parking and one way traffic, the same as we did it in 2019, which was what this originally was about. So it sounds like Tony, um, you've withdrawn your motion and now you're, you're amending your motion. So is there a second on the amended portion of the motion? So made by Councilor Littman. Is there any further discussion on that? Councilor Susi. Just one question, Mr. Mayor. Does that mm -hmm. mean the other, the other part of Tony's motion will not be coming back this year or does it come later no, on? No, it can still come back before the council. Okay. I think your question, he's withdrawn. If he withdraws the motion, he certainly can bring it at a future meeting. It seems to me, yes. Okay. Just not on the table right now. Okay, thank you. That's, I just wanted to know what we were voting on, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for keeping us focused, Councillor Susie. I appreciate that. <laughs> Any further discussion on Councillor Felcher's motion that's on the table? Seeing none, oh, go right ahead, Councillor Littman. I appreciate um, Councillor Felch um, modifying it to something we all can agree to, I think. Thank you. Mayor? Uh, yes, Councillor Hamill. Okay, I'm like Councillor Susie. I want to make sure on this. So we are voting on the temporary traffic order that was in place for 2019. And nothing yeah, else. what we're doing is we're asking, if I may, we're asking the city council, uh, the city manager, excuse me, to draft up a parking order uh, similar. Uh, to the one done in 2019, which was obviously pre-pandemic and would be at 100% capacity, if you will, something more. With all the proper dates and stuff like that. With the, pro with the proper dates, yes. Okay. So and that'll right be ahead. on the agenda for the next meeting. Yes. Or we just oh, approving it and he's going to make the adjustments. Correct. Okay. Why don't we do, why don't we do that? I, I think in terms of, uh, I think there's a strong consensus to allow the parking just to fill in the right things that the manager needs to do to make it 2021 
I'd be I'd be in favor of moving it along so we can deal with other issues at a future meeting. Uh, I, I would agree. Let's let's uh, I, I think we should empower the city manager to draft it as he see fit based on the, the, the template of 2019. I don't I think it needs to come back to be voted on. I would look for a motion to allow him to do that. That's the motion I made. It's already been made and seconded. You're a tough counselor to keep up with tonight, Councilor Felch. I'd ask the council, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilor Cheney. Yes. Councilor Susie. Yes. Councilor Littman. Yes. Councilor Haynes. Yes. Councilor Hamill. Yes. Councilor Felch. Yes. That's a. Um, Six votes in the affirmative and that motion passes. Thanks for your patience, counselors. <clears throat> and uh, counselors, I, I, I would like to consider at some point here uh, reconvening uh, the city council in a special meeting. Uh, Scott, do you have a date? Should we go out a week or should, would, be, would 10 days be more appropriate based on maybe some timeline from some um, data coming out of the state or the CDC? If, if the state is consistent with having the vaccination updates and a Tuesday report, which I believe they are, uh, maybe we look to target something for um, Wednesday, May 5th or Thursday, May 6th. That would give us uh, a, a week in a couple of days. Councilor Littman, do you have a question on that? Why don't we wait till we see what is officially comes out on the seventh as the guidance? That might that might give us some insights that we don't have on the fifth or the sixth. Can we do it on? We do it the following. If, if that's if that's the case, we've got a regular meeting on Monday, May tenth. So if the guidance changes, the governor is going to bring forward going to are going to come out May seventh, which is a Friday. We can just schedule something on the agenda for General Motorcycle Week discussion regarding vendors, beer tents, and updated state best practices. We could start, we could start earlier to accommodate um, you know, full discussion. We are starting at 6 o'clock with the school budget presentation. Well, could we push that off a meeting? Because they, they, They've got... Um, they really they asked for that like two months ago because that ties into when they have to extend uh, teacher contracts and that's an important date for them. So let's meet Tuesday then. <laughs> Tuesday at what what date? Are you talking about Tuesday yeah, the eleventh? Yeah. I'd much rather have it on that Monday. I think we could get it in. I mean, look how much discussion we've had tonight on all kinds of stuff. That's fine. People want to go later. That's fine. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I just, I, in terms of uh, earlier than six o'clock, it's just not doable on my part. I got to work. <laughs> no, I think we'll be fine. But this is the first item on the agenda. Get it out of the way and then go to the school budget. Well, the school budget's got to oh, be. School, school starts at six. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Let's, um, I wanted to get to it a little bit sooner. Um, I certainly, you know, my hopes are, have been that we'd have really solid data in, in an ideal situation would allow us to, to ramp up Motorcycle Week. And I would like to get that information, that data sooner, which would allow us to make that decision. Um, maybe it's just not going to work. Maybe perhaps we can, I really don't want to push it into Tuesday, the 11th. I guess I'd like to keep it on the 10th. Um, Scott, okay. and, and move it to one of the first things we talk about right out of the gate. Um, okay. Mayor. Mayor. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Yes, go ahead, Councilor Hamill. Yes. Um, not to throw a log on the fire, but, uh, you know, these are all uh, New Hampshire statistics, and um, there'll be a lot of visitors from all the New England states. So I don't know if we can get a little information from those states too, or do you just want to keep it in New Hampshire? I mean, they'll that, be coming that, from yeah. New York. They'll be coming from everywhere. That's a that's a that's a very good question. I think maybe we can look at um, why don't we take a look at New England data to start? Okay. Um, I mean, that would be where most of them would come from. I would think. 
I, I, I think so as well. I mean, if we have a, we have data that's overwhelmingly positive coming from the New England states, particularly New Hampshire, then I think maybe we're, you know, we're in a good position to revisit this decision. Um, Cause I, I believe right now still uh, the Canadian border is still closed. So uh, I don't know if they're thinking about opening that, but our visitors from the North may not be able to come. Yeah. Uh, New okay. Jersey and New York. Cause that's another large group that comes here. Yeah. That's another what? Uh, uh, Council let me in here. Large group that comes up is New Jersey and New York. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, Scott, in anticipation of that meeting, maybe that's the, the catchment area we should be looking at, right? Um, New York, New Jersey, north, or east, north, north and east. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Oh, yes, sir. I'm sorry, Council Haynes. Go right ahead. If we have a special meeting, is, are we going to finalize this? Or are we going to have a special meeting of a special meeting of a special meeting so it goes to the day before the rally starts? I, I'd like to have a finality to this. Uh, um, thank you, Councilor Haynes. I certainly would. I think we'd all like to have a finality uh, to it as well. Um, if we were to make a decision based on data today, I, I don't know how favorable it would be. Uh, so uh, buying a little extra time so we can get updated and relevant data, I think would be helpful. I too don't wanna go to the day before the event and think it's gonna make a difference, it's not. I think a month out is probably as close as we wanna cut it. So I think at some point we need to make that decision. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Councilor Haynes. Um, Mr. Myers, yes. Yeah, I, I would echo that statement that we need to come to a final decision and not keep hunting on it and, and not saying the 10th is too late, but um, particular for police with looking at uh, details and if we're looking to engage out of town police department, if things do expand and we are adding additional you know, stages and beer tents and that type of stuff, that's going to require additional police presence and planning time on the part of you know, the chief and his staff. So um, I, I would hope wherever we end up that the 10th might be the day that we make a decision and say this is how it's going to look for 2021. Okay. Councilor Lippman. I was wondering if the, the manager, I think you outlined a number of other activities that, you know, many of which would be um, um, possible to do. Um, if you could just kind of review what other activities you already think could happen. It's just a matter that they haven't come forward to be asked. Could you review that one more time? Yeah, I believe that they came in late this afternoon to, uh, to planning or special events, but I think the swap meet is going on, is scheduled to go on, but the uh, hill climb, I believe, came in today. All of the rides, um, the council already approved um, a while back. Uh, anybody who is a year round or even on a quarterly basis, entertainment venue, um, who gets their license that's separate just from the 10 day motorcycle week. We've been proactively contacting them and encouraging them to make sure that they're in the queue to get their license. So that would include um, Tower Hill Tavern, the big house, what was known as the, um, the marketplace where the Ames had it and just sold it. And I, I'm drawing a blank on the new name there, uh, the Naswa, Crazy Gringo, uh, the Looney Bin, um, the, the, the Boardwalk Cafe uh, gets a license, um, 405 for Tellos, Hectors. I mean, I think there's probably 12 or 15 entertainment venues that are some inside, some outside. Um, and, and, and also don't forget the city has also um, been supportive of the additional dining outdoor tents uh, you know, that everybody scrambled to get going last year. And we're still continuing to support those um, as far as we know right now. And some of that may change a little bit with what the governor may give his best practices. If, if he says, and, I, and I'm not saying he is, and it's good, bad or whatever, but if he says everything is open up 100% inside from a city, we have to look now at these outdoor tents and say, are they in people's parking lots where they put the tents up? And now therefore, if they're open 100% inside, they need those parking spaces. So therefore the outdoor dining tent, you know, has to go now or go through a more formal approval process. So those are the iterations that we don't know sitting here today based on what may happen with the reopening committee and best practices on May 7th. 
So that's why I say from a planning purpose with inspections, with police, um, you know, the appropriate police coverage based on what is happening. Those are things we need to start planning for. And I think really that May 10th date is there, but um, you know, restaurants are open. We're not doing anything with restaurants. We're not doing anything with bars. They're controlled um, by, by state mandates right now or soon to be state best practices. So whatever's in place from the state is there, the entertainment's there, the rides, you know, the vendors to 50% capacity, um, you know, that's, that's what's going on. And, you know, there's, so there's that capacity outside that'll be going on top of the capacity that's going to be increasing inside more than likely. Could we get for the 10th when we meet is all the things you just listed. Those are all possibilities that could happen um, within the existing guidelines. In other words, all the things you just listed would be um, within bounds to happen, um, save the bear tents that are the extras and the extra outdoor stages. So I guess I just wanna yeah. make sure everybody has a full picture that this is much more than 2020 ever looked like. Absolutely. So yes, all those, all those things can occur um, barring the state coming out and saying and putting more restrictions on, which does not seem like the direction is going, all of those things will occur. But yes, I'll, I'll compile a list of those so you have that in front of you. I just think we need to be fully apprised of, of what all the options that are available. Okay. Are we ready to uh, ready to move on from, from this item? Mm -hmm. Re refresh my recollection. Did we vote on this motion? Yes. yes you did. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, good. All right. All right. So um, that concludes uh, the agenda this evening. Uh, we will be going into a non-public session shortly. When we return from the non-public session, it will be only to adjourn the meeting. There will be no business taken up when we return from non-public. Uh, just to We're just going to adjourn. So be looking to uh, go into a non-public session under RSA 91-A32. And this would be... Uh, You're going to go letter small e, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, small e. Consideration or negotiation of pending claims or litigation which has been threatened in writing or filed against the body or agency or any subdivision thereof or against any member thereof because his membership in such body or agency until the claim or litigation has been fully adjudicated or otherwise settled. So uh, we need the motion to jump out of that. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Point of, point of order. Do Please. we have to take a special vote that we're gonna continue after 10 o'clock? Uh, good question. Yes, you would suspend the rules to complete the non-public session. So that motion could come right now if you wanted to make that, Councilor Haynes. Yes, I'll make the motion that we uh, continue in. beyond the 10 o'clock hour. Seconded by Councilor Felch. Any further discussion? The clerk will call the roll, please. Councilor Cheney. You got a vote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Okay, thank you, Councillor Stewart. Yes. Councillor Whitman. Yes. Councillor Haynes. Yes. Councillor Hamill. Yes. Councillor Felch. Yes. Six votes in the affirmative. We're going to continue. We're suspending the rules. Motion to suspend the rules. Um, and is there a vote to go into non-public right now, or do we just go, Scott? I'm sorry. So you have to have a vote. Roll call vote. Uh, so I'd ask the clerk to call the roll, please. I need a first and a second to go into the non-public. So may, first by Councillor Lippman, seconded by Councillor Hamill. Thank you. Councillor Cheney. Yes. Councillor Susie. Yes. Councillor Lippman. Yes. Councillor Haynes. Yes. Councillor Hamill. Yes. Councillor Felt. Yes. Six votes in the affirmative that motion passes. We'll be now moving to non-public session. Oh, good point. <coughs>
There's the cat. <laughs> He's like, come on, Tony, time to feed me. You guys are dragging this out tonight. Yeah, she's been pretty quiet tonight. <laughs> oh. We have enough for two. Uh... So, hi. I think we have a quorum, don't you? I, I believe we have a quorum. So yep. uh, we're back into... Uh, Public session at 1017 p.m. Um, be a motion to seal the non-public minutes. Councilor Littman. Six months, please. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilor Felch. Is that okay? I'd ask uh, the city manager to call the roll. Okay, so for a few of you chiming in here, it's the motion to seal the minutes for six months. Councilor Littman? Yes. Councilor Felch? Yes. Councillor Susie, Yes. Councillor Hamill? These guys are mute. Councillor Cheney? Muted. He's muted. Uh, we need one more. Uh, we need one more. Uh, uh, Councillor Hayes is joining me in my office. Okay, Councillor Haynes, motion to seal the minutes for six months. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> I think I think Mark's getting on Glenn's link. Councillor Haynes? Yes. Motion to seal the minutes for six months? Yes. Okay. So that's uh and Councillor Hamill? Councillor Cheney? Okay, so yes. that's four votes. Four votes in the four affirmative. Four votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. Minutes are sealed for six months. I'd like to uh, adjourn this council meeting of uh, April 26th.